Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily David. I'm a research associate at the Project 2049 Institute. Um, on behalf of the Project 2049 Institute and the Global Taiwan Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our joint uh, conference, um, Phase Zero, A New Taiwan Policy. Um, it, it's a beautiful day outside, and I think a great day to talk about both current and the future prospects for US Taiwan policy. So, Thank you for taking your time uh, inside, outside, of the, or out of the sunshine to spend it with us. We really appreciate it, and we hope you enjoy the lineup we have for you here today. Uh, this gentleman needs no introduction, uh, but it is my honor to introduce uh, the current chairman of the Project 2049 Institute, current president of Armitage International, and former deputy secretary of state, among other distinguished titles, the Honorable uh, Mr. Richard Armitage. Thank you, Emily. Well, good, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, this is a banner day for Project 2049. We had 163 RSVPs, which for us is a record. Uh, so thank you very much. So I'm doubly honored, first of all, by being able to welcome all of you. And in a few minutes, after a couple of remarks, which I promise will be brief, I get to welcome to his first public uh, occasion our new president of Project uh, 2049, my dear friend, John Gastright. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to tell a joke. I wasn't planning to, <laughs> but I saw Dave Keegan, and I'm going to tell you a story. Dave was the, the Taiwan country director in, in the Department of State, and he's a keen bicyclist. And he would come bicycling in in the morning. And at the time, Taiwan was not something that was on the front frontal lobe of the brain or the mind of every single uh, person on the seventh floor of the State Department. Uh, so Dave would come in, ride his bike in, and stay in his bicycle gear. Well, this fact was made known to me, and I decided to have some fun. So had my office call down to Dave's office and say, could you come up and see me in about 10 minutes? And of course, he went and took his coat off the rack and, and his pants up and all of that. Got all dressed. I waited five minutes and had my secretary call back down and say, oh, Dave, can you, can you delay that another couple hours? But we did that like three times that day. <laughs> Randy Shriver, the President Assistant Secretary of Defense, knew completely and totally what was going on because I'd staffed the whole thing. So, Dave, nice to see you again, and thanks for letting us have a little fun. If the 163 RSVPs to this event are indicative of interest in Taiwan, just think of how excited our friends are going to be in Honolulu when Tsai Ing-wen shows up there on the 24th, 25th of this month uh, on the eve of her trip to Palau, the Marshalls, and, and Nauru, uh, which was advanced by very distinguished Foreign Minister Joseph Wu a couple of weeks ago. I think it is indicative of the type of crowd she's going to have who want to hear what President Tsai has to say. You know, in having a discussion 40 years after the TRA is about time, isn't it? What a different, I had a small, small bit to do with it. I was Bob Dole's chief of staff. Uh, and I assure you, my bit of the TRA was small, uh, but for me, it looms large, if only for the reason that it reminds me of how damn old I'm getting. <laughs> 40 years. So it is time to do you a little re rethinking, because 40 years ago, it was a different, undemocratic Taiwan. It was a different technology-oriented oriented Taiwan. It was a different region, didn't have such an aggressive uh, China, as we do now, the U.S. force posture was different. We were just recovering from Vietnam. We were exhausted. Uh, we're somewhat exhausted now because of the wars we've had, but then we were really exhausted. That does remain in the frontal part of my mind. So isn't it about time that we spend some time thinking about U.S. policy and seeing if we can come up with a few useful projections of how we might usefully suggest to policymakers that they change policy to bring it up to 2019. That's our task here today. Uh, you'll be the judge of whether uh, the different members of the panels are able to do that. I'm certainly trusting that, that they will, but that's our purpose and that's why we've dedicated ourselves here today. Now the second honor I have, in addition to welcoming you all, is to, as I say, introduce our new president, John Gastright. Now, why is John the president of 2049? Well, it's the only job John has not had. <laughs> He's been a police officer in Charleston, South Carolina, college athlete, Citadel graduate, two master's degrees, 
Uh, I've been a naval officer, a Hill staffer, came to the State Department, recruited by somebody who happens to be standing up here now, uh, and I didn't realize how lucky uh, I was. Uh, he was a special assistant uh, for me for a while, worked in every one of our regional and functional bureaus, uh, ended up uh, as a legislative director for House Affairs in the State Department, and then as the de Deputy Assistant Secretary of Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, et cetera. Not exactly light lifting. So the only job John hasn't had is the one he has now. And so I have, without any further palaver, uh, the honor of introducing my friend, our new president, John Gastright, and he will do the introductions of, of our speakers this morning. And of course, we'll end up this afternoon uh, with Senator Cory Booker, uh, the uh, leading, uh, the, well, the, the majority uh, on the, uh, East, the Asia Subcommittee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So, John, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. And, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is called a hard act to follow. Uh, obviously, thank you, Ambassador Armitage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to thank the Global Taiwan Institute, uh, GTI Chairman Chin, and uh, my good friend Russell Xiao uh, for all of their support in putting this uh, tremendous event together today. I think in just a few short years, GTI has made such a contribution to the study of Taiwan and has enriched discussions to enhance U.S.-Taiwan relationships and shed light on Taiwan's contribution to the global community. We're honored today to have, uh, to work with GTI and appreciate your hard work putting this together. And thanks to your entire staff. At Project 2049, our mission is a more secure Asia by the century's midpoint. One of the mainstays of Asian security has been, as Mr. Armand just said, the Taiwan Relations Act. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the signing of the Taiwan Relations Act. And today's conference, entitled uh, Phase Zero, a new Taiwan policy, will address current U.S. Taiwan policy framework and discuss policy options to guide the relationship into the future. But the Taiwan Relations Act isn't the only anniversary we're celebrating here in 2019. These other important milestones also help frame the shape of things. This is the 40th anniversary of U.S. diplomatic relationships with the People's Republic of China. It's the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre. It's been 23 years since the third Taiwan Strait Crisis when Beijing threatened free elections with uh, its missile force. And next year, 2020, will mark the seventh presidential election in Taiwan. So given these milestones, what's the state of play? In stark contrast to the freedoms enjoyed on Taiwan, Beijing's coercive political, economic, and military activities toward the Taiwan government and its people suggest more needs to be done. And that's what we're here to explore today. What are the current factors influencing and changing the changing environment in U.S.-Taiwan policy. What are the prospects for U.S.-Taiwan policy in the age of strategic competition? And what's the ideal in-state for U.S.-Taiwan relations? To kick things off this morning and start this important discussion, it's my great pleasure to turn to the chairman of the Global Taiwan Institute, Dr. Chen Wen Yen. Born in Taiwan, Dr. Chen received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees from the National Taiwan University and his PhD in psychology from the City University of New York, New York. Dr. Chin served as faculty and chairperson of the psychology department and associate dean of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of District of Columbia. After retiring, he decided it was still time to work and he taught a course on Taiwan's history as an adjunct professor at George Mason University. He's been involved in the Taiwan democracy movement since the Formosa incident in 1979, and has served as an advisor to the office of the Taiwan's president. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Chin. Uh, thank you, Zhang, for the introduction. And welcome, to all, welcome you all to the conference. It is an honor to, uh, for, great, for Global Taiwan Institute, Institute to co-host with Project 2049 uh, Institute to hold the conference to mark the 40th anniversary 
of TRA. Global Taiwan Institute is a new institute in Washington, D.C. It is a 501c3 nonprofit privately funded organization dedicated to strengthening Taiwan and U.S. relations. The TRA in the past 40 years, as John indicated, has proven to be a cornerstone for the U.S.-Taiwan relations. It has not only provides a framework in which U.S. and Taiwan develop strong and enduring framework on official relations. It also helps maintain peace and stability in the region. Because of U.S. support under TRA, Taiwan also undertook a historical transformation from a, an authoritarian regime to a completely, truly democratic nation. Citizens of Taiwan nowadays enjoy unprecedented freedom and protection of their civil and human rights. Just read the Taiwan news media, you know what I mean. While we celebrate the accomplishment of TRA, we must also recognize that the world has changed a lot. We saw Soviet Union become disintegrated, and we saw the establishment of the European Union. We saw the spread of terrorism in the world and the 911 attack on the U.S. soil. In East Asia, we saw North Korea develop missiles and nuclear weapons. We saw Chinese democracy movement crushed in Tiananmen Square. We saw <coughs> Deng Xiaoping's open door policy has transformed China since 1970s into an economic power. With the, it in, China also invested a last, vast sum of national resources to modernize its military forces with the goal of achieving their national goal of Chang, Fu Guo Changbing to, to make country rich and military strong, strengthening neighbors and projecting powers. China is not the country we saw in the 1970s and 80s. With the economic and military power, China has intensified its threat to Taiwan, has undermined Taiwan's democratic system by united front tactic, vowing to uni unify Taiwan by force if necessary. The rise of China is threatening the very existence of democratic Taiwan. And yet, the U.S. policy toward Taiwan based on TRA basically has not changed much in the past 40 years. In the face of the new cross-street reality, it is about time to reassess our Taiwan policy. The conference is both timely, timely and important. I hope this would be the beginning of a discussion of new policy that would last another 40 years. Thank you for your attendance and your participation in this conference. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Chin. <clears throat> now, before we begin the process of breaking down U.S. policy and looking ahead to the future, we're fortunate to, as the saying goes, hear from the horse's mouth. <laughs> so what is current U.S. policy? U.S.-Taiwan policy. There's no one more qualified to answer that question than uh, our current guest, our, our next guest, excuse me, uh, Jim Heller, is the director of the Office of Taiwan Coordination at the U.S. Department of State and a career member of the Senior Foreign Service. He served twice at Embassy Beijing, most recently as Deputy Political Counselor. Additional assignments include all easy spots, uh, Embassy Seoul, Embassy Kiev, and with uh, the Expeditionary Department of State, a regional reconstruction team in Erbil. He has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's of Arts from the University of Michigan, go blue, and is a Hopkins Nanjing Center graduate. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Mr. Jim Heller. John, thank, thank you very much for the kind int introduction. And thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, come say a few words. And, and we're, we're, we're really thankful to Project 2049 Institute and Global Taiwan Institute for organizing a, a discussion focused on US-Taiwan relations. Our office, we, we see a lot of the invitations that go around uh, because we're co-located uh, kind of down the office suite from the China desk. And so we see you know, a lot of uh, uh, PRC-focused events. So we are always grateful, and uh, the folks in, in our office are always grateful to see events that are focused on Taiwan. So thank, thank you very much. And as Mr. Armitage said, please, we, we're particularly glad to see this kind of discussion looking forward and, and doing a little brainstorming about uh, ways that we can take, take the relationship in, in new directions. So we, uh, we look forward to seeing the outcomes of the discussion today. As we prepare to mark the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, we in the State Department are looking ahead to the future of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. Nothing makes a more powerful statement about the future and about the vibrancy and strength of U.S.-Taiwan relations in the 21st century than our state-of-the-art new office complex in Taipei's Neihu District. As AIT Director Brent Christensen noted, in a speech at Stanford University last week, AIT is preparing to move into the new facility in, as he put it, the short term. And I really mean the short term. <laughs> this magnificent facility, which was dedicated last summer, serves as an important and literally concrete symbol of the US commitment to Taiwan, of the close ties that link the people of the United States with the people of Taiwan. In addition to the upcoming big move, for each month this year, AIT will be celebrating a different aspect of our relationship with Taiwan through a variety of events and programs. It's worth briefly reflecting on the depth and breadth of that relationship. Since 1979, the United States and Taiwan have built a comprehensive, durable, and mutually beneficial partnership grounded in our shared interests and increasingly over time, our shared values. Our partnership today truly runs the gamut, including security. The Taiwan Relations Act clearly articulates certain US commitments to Taiwan, including the commitment to providing Taiwan with arms of a defensive character, trade, we have grown to become each other's 11th and second largest goods trading partners, respectively. Taiwan is also an important buyer of US goods and services. Investment, the stock of bilateral foreign direct investment between the United States and Taiwan now exceeds $25 billion. Education and cultural exchanges, Taiwan remains one of the largest sources per capita of international students in the United States. Our relationship also includes an important public health dimension. And with the World Health Assembly, the WHA, just a few weeks away, I'd like to stress that the United States will continue to support Taiwan's membership in international organizations where statehood is not a requirement for membership and its meaningful participation in international organizations where statehood is a requirement. Public health is one prominent example of a sector where it is in everyone's interest for Taiwan to play a role in addressing global challenges. That is why we will continue to support Taiwan's meaningful participation in the upcoming WHA. The World Health Organization's decision last year to again deny Taiwan an invitation to participate in the WHA as an observer was deeply troubling. This and other attempts by China to exclude Taiwan from international organizations 
prevents the international community from benefiting from Taiwan's expertise, harms cross-strait relations, and runs counter to Beijing's own professed goal of winning the support of the people of Taiwan. Along with efforts in international organizations, the United States, as we move forward, will continue to look for other ways for Taiwan to earn the dignity and respect that its contributions to global challenges merit. The Global Cooperation and Training Framework, the GCTF, launched by AIT and its Taiwan counterpart, TECRO, in 2015, combines US and Taiwan resources and capabilities to help partners throughout the Indo-Pacific region address pressing global challenges. More than 200 policymakers and experts from dozens of countries have participated in more than 10 programs on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, public health, energy, women's economic empowerment, and the digital economy. Working with our partners in Taiwan going forward, we will continue to expand the GCTF. In closing, let me emphasize that Taiwan's transformation from an island ruled by martial law to a beacon of democracy is one of the most compelling developments of the late 20th and early 21st centuries, a great accomplishment for the people of Taiwan that continues to inspire not just Americans, but many others around the world. As we look forward to the next 40 years, we can be confident of a few things. Namely, the United States and Taiwan will continue to grow closer. U.S. commitments to Taiwan and to the region more broadly will remain solid. Taiwan will continue to grow stronger and its vibrant democracy will remain central to its continued success. And as was articulated by Vice President Pence in his speech at the Hudson Institute last October, that America will always believe that Taiwan's embrace of democracy shows a better path for all the Chinese people. The United States is and will remain a true friend of Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> OK, we're really rolling now. It takes two to tango. So we thought, now that we've heard from the United States government, wouldn't it be great to get Taiwan's take? To provide that, we asked the speaker of Taiwan's legislative yuan to record some thoughts that we could share today, thanks to the magic of a compact disc. <laughs> so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Speaker Su.阿敏塔吉我是中华民国台湾的立法院长苏家全 
能够以影片的方式与各位隔空相见。今年是台湾关系法通过四十周年，感谢二零四九计划研究所以及全球台湾研究中心举办。相关的研讨会，共同探讨台美关系的未来。二零四九计划研究所和全球台湾研究中心都是台美政策研究的权威，并且持续培养优秀人才，十分的荣幸能够以立法院长的身份，在这样一个。重要的场合，代表台湾向各位致意。台湾关系法是美国在与中华民国断交之后，由国会所主导通过的一部法律，内容是保障台美人民能够顺畅交流往来，更强调美国国会严重的关切，任何以非和平的方式。决定台湾的前途的行为，虽然这是一部美国的国内法，但是它的影响力却跨越整个太平洋，成为台湾海峡的防卫网，有效遏阻中国的侵略。台湾关系法实施以来，美国历经多次政党轮替，但它的效力从未。因为政府的更换而有所改变，这正好说明了民主制度才是世界上最稳定的政治制度。因为只有在民主制度下，透过民意所制定的法律，才能够历久不衰，才能够带来和平。同时，台湾关系法的通过。也为台美国会的关系埋下友谊的种子，并且持续成长茁壮。去年三月份，众议院外交委员会洛伊斯主席率团访问立法院，我以立法院长的身份为洛伊斯主席颁赠国会外交荣誉奖章。以及证书，以表达我们对 r o y c e 主席致力维护台美关系的由衷的感谢。另外，当参议员、军事委员会马坎主席离世的时候，我也以台湾国会议长的身份，代表我国出席追思会，同时也拜访了。众议院莱恩议长、参议院外交委员会亚太小组贾德纳主席，并与多位参众议员会谈，促进两国国会的交流。这一些友好且实质的互动，持续为台美国会的关系增温。美国国会这几年来通过。许多由台的决议或法案，包括众议院在二零一六年将雷根总统所提出的对台六项保证，诉诸文字，以及去年所通过的台湾旅行法、亚洲再保证倡议法，现在的台美关系是。两国自断交以来最密切友好的时刻，在经贸方面，台湾是美国第十一大的贸易伙伴。二零一八年，台湾政府也响应川普总统的经济政策，派遣台湾的企业领袖访问团前往华府出席。选择美国投资高峰会，中油、红海、台硕等重量级的企业，也在台美
友好合作的稳定基础下，展开实质对美的投资、采购，体现台美强劲的经贸关系，在军事合作的方面。我们要特别感谢美国政府，在二零一七年宣布对台十四点二亿美元的军售，二零一八年再宣布三点三亿美元的军售。我们也乐见美国国会去年所通过的国防授权法案。其中有关台湾的部分，明确的指出，支持实质提升台美关系的访问和军事的交流。台湾位处东亚第一岛链的前沿，几十年来，这块土地上的人民以无可撼动的决心，以及坚强的经济。与军事实力坚守在最前线，守护整个民主世界的稳定发展，让中国共产政权无法突破这个岛链。然而，这也让台湾背负着中国长久以来文攻武吓的压力。以及在国际外交上的处处矮化，随着中国国力的成长，不仅为台湾带来更加巨大的威胁与挑战，也严重的影响印太区域的和平与稳定。所幸，在国际社会上，民主盟友对台湾的支持。让我们有更大的信心，面对当前严峻的局面。在此要诚挚的感谢卢比欧等十六位参议员联名致函川普总统，要求川普政府依据《台湾关系法》的承诺，全面执行《台湾旅行法》以及《亚洲在保证倡议法》。派遣阁员、层级的官员来访台。此外，我们也要感谢川普政府与二零一七年公布的国家安全战略报告，重申在《台湾关系法》之下对台湾的安全承诺。事实上，除了台湾积极肩负起维护印太区域。和平与稳定的责任，为国际社会带来正面效应。美国更是整个民主世界中最有能力扭转当前不安局面的实质力量。提出对台六项保证的雷根总统曾经说过：“如果我们真的关心和平。”就一定要强大到足以在没有和平的地方创造和平。川普总统竞选的时候，也引用雷根总统的口号，让美国再次伟大。我们相信，若美国能够积极支持台湾，以民主、自由在。国际社会立足，不仅是延续美国伟大、最有力的证明，同时也是创造印太地区和平稳定的最重要的关键。在台湾关系法通过四十周年的重要时刻，期待未来美国能够。与台湾继续站在一起，深化台美国会的交流，提升台美高层的互动与往来，加强紧密结盟，让我们共同携手捍卫自由、民主
与人权的普世价值。在此，敬祝会议顺利成功，在座各位健康平安，谢谢大家。Hi everyone, I'm Marcia Burtsai Kelly. I'm the program manager at Global Taiwan Institute. We are going to move into panel one now, titled US Taiwan Policy, the Current Debate. What's the difference? Between me so, and no, Marcia came in and said, oh, "Hi, John," and I said, "Hi, Tiffany," and that was Marcia. So, oh well, it happened. I'm sorry. It just, my, I, I'm, I'm blind to these sorts of things. Go away, 同志和朋友们，大家好。我们今天 Sure, lead. Good. Okay, good. excellent. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Tiffany Ma. I am a senior director with Bao Group Asia. And for those of you who are not familiar with BGA, we are a government affairs and public policy advisory service uh, firm based out in the DC area. But we actually have more than 20 local offices throughout the Indo-Pacific, including in Taiwan. And it is my great privilege to be moderating this afternoon's panel. Uh, before I start, I do want to give my thanks to Project 2049 Institute and the Global Taiwan Institute as well for co-hosting this very timely debate and conversation on how we're talking about U.S.-Taiwan policy at this present time. Today's discussion is an opportunity for us to explore the spectrum of views that exist when it comes to U.S.-Taiwan policy and, indeed, when it comes to the importance of Taiwan to the United States or even the consequences of U.S. policy towards Taiwan. And it's perhaps no surprise that this is a very active and ongoing debate that we've seen really gain traction and even more attention in recent years as the stakes become ever higher in the Taiwan Strait. And coupled with the increasing attention of U.S. administrations to the Indo-Pacific, so when we look at U.S.-Taiwan policy today, it's important for us in this room as analysts and observers to understand you know, where the spectrum of the debate currently lies and also what really drives this debate forward or backward. For example, uh, how should we think about the arguments for strengthening U.S.-Taiwan relations versus those that argue for more caution out of deference to perhaps other U.S. interests in the region? Even more critically, has this spectrum of opinions on U.S.-Taiwan policy shifted in recent years? While the basic tenets of U.S. policy towards Taiwan remains a combination of the Taiwan Relations Act, the three communiques, and the six assurances, but how has the way we talked about Taiwan and U.S. priorities when it comes to Taiwan evolved in recent years? And, you know, drawing from these questions, you know, what are some of the key elements for strategically sound and sustainable U.S. policy towards Taiwan for this administration and beyond? And with those questions put out there, I'm very pleased to introduce a panel that is going to help me address some of these questions today. So beginning from my left-hand side, I am very pleased to introduce Shirley Khan um, and to be fair, I don't think anybody on this panel requires any introductions, but this is part of my role as moderator. Shirley uh, is an independent specialist in Asian security affairs. Uh, she has, was previously with the Congressional Research Service, where she authored many of the seminal reports on U.S.-Taiwan relations as well as cross-strait relations. Uh, further left, we have Dr. David Keegan, who is currently teaching 
um, at the Foreign Service Institute. He is also an adjunct lecturer at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Uh, before retiring in 2012, Dr. Keegan uh, served as a Foreign Service officer uh, for over 30 years. So we have a lot of expertise just on this side of the panel. So turning over to my right-hand side, we have John Tasik, uh, currently with the International Assessment and Strategy Center. And he previously served for 24 years in the State Department, notably 20 of those working in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and at the State Department as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that was, yes, that's, that's, they all know me. I know, <laughs> this is part of my responsibility. So. Um, so further right is Mark Stokes. Again, no, needs no introduction, but Mark is the Executive Director of the Project 2049 Institute. Uh, previously, he was the founder and president of Quantum Pacific Enterprises, an international consulting firm, and he was also the vice president and Taiwan country manager for Raytheon International previously. So as you can see, there is uh, a wealth of expertise um, on this panel, and our panelists need no further introductions, so I will jump straight into uh, the beginning of the discussion. And what I really want to do is kind of establish a baseline for how we ought to understand where the uh, debate on U.S.-Taiwan policy currently lies. So I, I'm going to ask the panelists to very briefly, uh, in hopefully less than two minutes each, just to give us um, a brief assessment of how they would characterize the debate on U.S.-Taiwan policy today and what they think are the key drivers of that move the debate um, on U.S.-Taiwan policy in recent years. So with that, I am going to start to my left. I, one of us needs I to start. Right. The, um, I think we've had a number of discussions. Can you hear? Yes. We've had a lot of issues um, in dealing with Taiwan for, for decades. The question of Taiwan has to do with you know, the fundamental question of how do we have a peaceful resolution. The United States policy is very, very clear that only the Taiwan Relations Act matters not the joint communiques, and actually to a lesser event, extent even the six assurances. In terms of binding U.S. law that guides U.S. policy, it is very clear that it is the Taiwan Relations Act that is the only thing that matters. Now, I, I, I'm a champion of the congressional role, having worked for Congress for decades, and I really think Congress was brilliant in the way it crafted the language of the TRA. Let's think about it. Congress did not have the benefit of hindsight. Back in 1979, people didn't know what was going to go happen, didn't know how things were going to um, shake out. And Congress wrote a very brilliant law that has endured for 40 years and continues to provide the guidance and fundamental um, basis for policy going forward. Now, we can have day-to-day -day issues and debates. You know, Should there be visits by foreign ministers? Should there be visits by the defense minister? Can he or she come to this little tiny area of the District of Columbia? So, you know, sometimes you know, relatively pity questions can come up, as well as bigger question about, you know, peace and stability in, in the region. Um, I think looking forward, what is the benefit of this conference is that we have something that is forward-looking, not just backward-looking, but something forward-looking. Forward-looking and secondly, strategic. I think it, at some point we need to bring the discussion above these small day-to-day -day struggles, of you know, dealing with China's being marshes about this, about whether um, the foreign minister is in Los Angeles for on Monday just to give a, a simple speech from Taiwan, and to, to look at something more strategic. Because at the end of the day, what we're about in terms of US interests is preserving the sustainable, sustainability of peace <coughs> and stability, and also, and I would note, an expanded set of interests today compared to back in 1979. Because in 79, there was no legitimate democratic government in Taiwan. It was a dictatorship that did not enjoy that kind of legitimacy at all. So that was not the context for the TRA. And the congressional intent of the TRA was very important. The congressional intent of the TRA was to preserve the viability of Taiwan so that we would be free from the dictatorial authoritarian rule of the Communist Party in Beijing. So this is even more compelling of a case today when we have a legitimate democratic government in Taiwan. So that needs to be clarified, that needs to be enhanced. And now, um, to be fair, after so many years, although we have this brilliant policy, brilliant piece of legislation with very important congressional intent behind it, and we're, we are noting 
the 40th anniversary today, there has been a lot of ambiguity as well. And that ambiguity needs to be acknowledged because it has um, afforded some limitations. One of them, for example, is a misperception that U.S. policy only allows for some sort of so-called unofficial engagement with Taiwan. That is not in the TRA. Secondly, the TRA does not talk about a one-China policy. Thirdly, something that's inherent in the TRA is about providing for the self, uh, helping Taiwan with sufficient self-defense capability. But it is sometimes lost that this is also a mutual obligation. This is an important fact that Taiwan itself needs to enable itself to have a sufficient self-defense. This is not a US only obligation and that's inherent in the TRA for a mutual obligation. Now, as we look forward, if we are concerned, if we're honest with ourselves that you know we critique the Orwellian nonsense coming from China, I think if we're honest with ourselves in Washington, we also need to think about whether there's some nonsense with our policy as well, uh, such as the very um, counterproductive, self-imposed restrictions on our contacts with the officials, uh, between the officials of both sides, whether in Defense Department, NSC, State Department, Commerce Department, USTR, et cetera. And now, members of Congress, of course, are not subject to these restrictions in the executive branch. So members of Congress have always been free to engage with, have always been free to engage with um, uh, the president of Taiwan or members of Congress from uh, members of uh, Taiwan's legislative yuan. Um, and then at the end of the day, I think we also have to look at the question, if we have a strategy, if we have a strategy, what is our strategic objective in this case? It is not enough to me to say, well, we want to maintain the status quo, but then also um, acknowledge that the status quo is being eroded today. It is not enough to say that we want to have a peaceful resolution when we don't talk about seriously in serious terms what would be the substance of such a peaceful resolution. It's not enough to talk about a peaceful resolution in the interests of the United States and, and other countries in the world for peace and stability and not have a serious creative look at what might be a U.S. role in working towards such a peaceful resolution. Uh, let me stop there. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Shirley. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with two personal footnotes. I'm going to start with some trepidation by completing Mr. Armitage's joke. Uh, a couple of days after the story he described, I got a phone call. You're due up in the EAP front office now. I have to change. I've got a yellow shirt and black tights on. You don't have time. Get a notebook, come up here. Okay, it's only the deputy assistant secretary. I can handle this. Wrong. He's taking me up to the seventh floor to see Mr. Armitage, and I'm standing outside Mr. Armitage's office with a bright yellow biking shirt and black tights. <laughs> Let us just say that wasn't the way I planned it. Second, um, 40 years ago, when we broke relations with Taiwan, I was a graduate student in Taiwan, walking the streets in Taiwan. And one of the things I remember starkly is the sense of gloom and foreboding in all the people I talked to. How long was Taiwan going to last? And I think looking back 40 years later, we can stop and say, wow, we are in a place that no one on those streets anticipated or could have imagined. And that is due, I believe, to two factors. One, the policy that has come out of the United States through the Taiwan Relations Act and the important contributions the Congress made uh, and through the administration and the three communiques, and yes, the six assurances, uh, which I am pleased to see in congressional uh, resolution today, because for many years when I was in my office uh, as Jim Heller's predecessor, seven or eight times removed, uh, I had to keep the six assurances in the safe. I'm pleased to see that instead <laughs> they're in congressional legislation where they belong. Um, but in addition, credit to the people on Taiwan. 
Yes, that's in the TRA and the communiques and so forth, but it is they who have made the difference in a very dangerous environment. Uh, and they who have created a government and a society uh, that could never have been imagined. So how did we get here? How do we move forward? I think Shirley's given us some very good context for that, some very important context for that. Um, Speaking from my State Department heritage, we always talk about the United States having a one China policy. Uh, and that was a curious formulation when it was created. It's an even more cu curious formulation today. Uh, but essentially, our policy always has been peaceful resolution. The challenge isn't, is that the right answer? And the challenge to me may be where it goes from here, although our imaginations may not stretch that far. Um, but I would argue as a fundamental strategy, that's not a bad place to begin. What we need is what I'm going to call strategy therapy. And by that I mean we're going to need some thought about how we actually make that happen. What does the United States do that makes a difference? What do the people on Taiwan, the government on Taiwan, do that makes a difference? And although I have absolutely zero optimism on this front, uh, what can uh, the leaders in Beijing do uh, that will shift their ac actions and decisions in a more constructive direction? Um, and I'm going to suggest um, a few practical avenues that we might look at. Um, and I'm going to begin by saying the restraint in the U.S. relationship with Taiwan is not something that people in the State Department welcome. It is something we operate within. Is it something the people in Taiwan welcome? No. But let us be clear. Taiwan is in a dangerous environment. And if anything, that environment is more dangerous today uh, than it was 30, 40 years ago. And that restraint has helped address that danger. It hasn't resolved it, but it has avoided unnecessary steps that could make the situation even more dangerous. And we don't need to think much farther into the past than 1995 and 96 to remember that we are not in a situation where military action is out of the question. We are, if anything, in an environment in which there are more coercive measures available to the leaders in Beijing than there were in 1995 and 96, both in a military sense and in a non-military sense. And we need to be aware of that. What I would argue the United States has failed to do, and Taiwan has failed to do, is we have failed to take the commitments we made as part of our strategy and actually implement them. We have spent a lot of time talking about how we would like to think, see things move. We have had lots of debates, and Taiwan has made lots of statements about what it would be willing to do. And many of those things have not happened. And I'll just give you the small example of the dollar signs that were flashed up about US arms sales to Taiwan. Those are statements of the dollar amounts of things we were willing at particular times to sell. They are not, cap in every case, and in many cases, capabilities on the ground. Taiwan needs to take a much more direct role in implementing, getting equipment that makes sense, not that's flashy, not that looks good, driving down an avenue, and not that can fly overhead in formation, but that actually contributes to security. We have to do much better in that as well. We also need to do better, I would argue, in other forms of security. And I'm gonna zero in on just one example. I am bewildered, to put it politely, why the United States is not negotiating a free trade agreement with Taiwan. I understand my colleagues in, in USTR and that Taiwan is not the largest economy, although certainly a significant one. But there are strategic stakes here. And those strategic stakes would be helped, and I believe helped significantly, by US-Taiwan free trade agreement 
and by US action in the TPP, and we can pursue that further. But I come back to, it's not a question of where we want to go to the extent our imagination will allow that. The question is, are we willing to engage in what I'm calling strategy therapy and actually do the things we have to do? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, turning to this side of the panel. Um, well, um, I can go first or? Sure. You can pick up where I leave off here, Isaac. I think I, as I look out over this crowd, I think uh, I can safely say that 100% of us value Taiwan very, very greatly. Um, there might be some from the Chinese embassy here. Um, who value it for different reasons, but uh, I think, however, we as U.S. citizens are primarily committed to U.S. interests, and we are committed to Taiwan because it's in U.S. interest to preserve the U.S. friendship and partnership with Taiwan. Now, everybody today has been talking about uh, 2019 is the 40th anniversary of the TRA. I... Uh, We'll remind everybody that today, uh, not today, but th this year is the 75th anniversary of the U.S. decision in 1944 to liberate the Philippines as General MacArthur wanted rather than to liberate Formosa as Admiral Nimitz needed. Nimitz saw Formosa as absolutely essential to U.S. strategy in defeating Japan and controlling the Pacific. Um, this is not that MacArthur disagreed with him. MacArthur had interests in the Philippines that were completely different from Nimitz's. And it's not that they were bad, a bad decision. I think actually maybe it wasn't such a bad decision. This is also 2019. This is the 70th anniversary of General MacArthur's island chain strategy that he developed in August of 49 which strongly criticized the Truman administration for its plans to abandon Formosa and give it to, to communist China, which had by that time not even occupied China at the time, but there it was. Um, I think there's been some discussion today of you know, what the importance of the 40th anniversary of the TRA is. To me, the most important thing of the TRA, the most important thing the TRA did, bar none, was to recognize Taiwan formally as an independent state under U.S. law. Now, that was not just in the, in the Taiwan Relations Act. God bless President Jimmy Carter, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. When he signed the executive order on December 30th, 20, uh, 1978, he said in there, everything, Taiwan will be handled exactly as it has been in the past. Everything in Taiwan will be, will be handled like it was a, an, an executive order said, uh, the, it, as if it were a country, state, government, foreign. Anytime that shows up in US law, that is the way Taiwan is to be treated. He also said all our treaties with Taiwan will be handled that way. So this is indeed, a, 2019 is indeed a wonderful year for anniversaries. Uh, Tiffany asked, what are the main issues now? What are we facing now that dif differs, that, that will change the debate? And to me, the biggest thing is changing U.S. perceptions of Taiwan as a sacrificial lamb and actually using it as a toma, as a bargaining chip. Three years ago, maybe four, two and a half years ago, Russell and I and a bunch of others had big debates over, you know, whether the new Trump administration and its transactional foreign policy was going to be a disaster for Taiwan. It's going to lead to, and my thought was, oh God, I wish we had been treating Taiwan as a, as a bargaining chip for the last 40 years. We'd have a much better relationship with Taiwan and a much more realistic relationship with China. From this point on, I think we're going to see, in fact, I, from 2017 on, I, I think we've been seeing that Taiwan has been viewed by the new administration as a partner 
and one that we should not yield. Or as perhaps President Trump would say, Taiwan is on extremely valuable real estate. And you just don't give up that real estate for nothing. And for the previous 40 years, we have been, we haven't built on that real estate. We haven't developed it. We haven't done anything to it. We've sort of kept it going. Maybe we go and mow the lawn a little bit, but you know, we don't treat that like valuable real estate. I think this is valuable real estate. And if we're going to continue to treat it as a, as a disposable piece of our, our uh, portfolio, we got to get something back for it. And blessed be the Lord, the Chinese have not given us anything for that. For that. The Chinese have demanded their rights in Taiwan. They have demanded that the United States recognize that they have a right title and claim to Taiwan. And they go down to the, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, city council and file their claim for a deed that the city council will make sure that they are put on. And Trump says, no, no, you have no, you have no right to this land at all. So I think what we're now looking at is a, as a, as a change in the framework and the entire perspective of the U.S. policy uh, debate on Taiwan from being the sacrificial lamb to now being a um, 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 Bargaining chip. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but that's I, I can I have twenty pages more to go, but I think I'll leave it at that. That's great. Thank you, John. Thank you for the uh, vivid real estate example. And then I would just add a footnote that this real estate comes with a population of twenty three million and a robust democracy, which I don't wow. think a corporation is very well equipped to deal with. But turning to Mark. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Tiffany, for that introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our Project 2049 staff and, uh, and uh, Russell and GTI for um, uh, organizing this event. So it was great, uh, great to be here to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Uh, what I'd like to do um, in the brief time we have available is maybe address uh, one of your, you had a lot of questions there, but uh, one, of, uh, one of the questions in terms of the debates. Um, or, I, I, or as I like to say, the schools of thought um, with regard to US policy, not just Taiwan, but um, Taiwan does have intrinsic value, but it's kind of hard to separate our Taiwan policy from our more general cross-strait policy. I would say there are four, um, ever since, I mean, we can put it all the way, you can date it back to 19, at least 1962, uh, in terms of some of the debates that have gone on, both in civil, civil society, which has been significant in shaping U.S. policy, as well as U.S. policy making itself. These four schools of thought, the first is the accommodationist school. Some call it abandonment school, but it, it, um, I, I think more uh, accommodation is more accurately reflects some of the positions. It, it's not so strong now, but um, an accommodation school, um, in essence, um, calls for an adjustment to U.S. policy that is much more in line with Beijing's concept and formula for cross-strait unification. Uh, in, in, their, in, in their mind, it's um, known as um, one country, two systems, and that is that there's one China, Taiwan is part of China, and the PRC is the sole representative of China in the international community. The accommodation school was probably the strongest, um, I would say maybe in the uh, late 2000s, um, when you had several editorials that were written calling for a review of the Taiwan Relations Act, focused exp uh, mostly on the two security-related provisions. That is, uh, the United States will provide Taiwan with necessary our, um, defense articles uh, and, and services necessary for sufficient self-defense, as well as maintaining the capacity to respond to use of force and other forms of coercion. Uh, striking those, for example, is a manifestation of this accommodationist policy. And accommodation, uh, those who have advocated accommodationist policy to include those calling for a freeze, if not halt, to US arms sales, uh, have, have articulated a fairly, um, I would say, strategic rationale for why this would be, in their view, in the U.S. interest. Um, you don't hear much about uh, this school of thought has, has um, been muted uh, more recently. The second school of thought is the status quo, the status quo school. And it is by far the most dominant and continues to be the dominant today. Status quo school um, uh, adheres to some form of a, a U.S. one China policy, but mostly guided by um, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, that is, we'll have uh, official relations with the People's Republic of China and unofficial relations with Taiwan. Our unofficial relations with Taiwan generally are, are characterized by 
undefined symbols of sovereignty. It's not clear what those are, but these generally would be outlined in um, gu guidelines that have been approved by um, uh, White House staff and, and uh, implemented by the State Department. But the status quo, uh, status quo school remains dominant until today. In the past, you have seen uh, debates primarily between these two schools, the accommodation school and the status quo school. But there is a third school, and that third school uh, is normalization, the straight up normalization. Um, it, it's uh, abandoning this notion uh, or narrative of, uh, of a US one China policy and just be um, um, going full toward uh, rec diplomatic recognition of Taiwan as Taiwan. Um, th this school uh, has had, um, I'd say, a significant voice in, uh, in, in the United States and has had some, some effect, but, um, but it, it's still, compared to the status quo school, relatively small. Uh, there has been, there's a fourth school, and this is the fourth and final school. The fourth school of thought is, for lack of a better term, is soft balancing. And I, I'm going to assume, perhaps, in the next panel, this, this would be um, uh, discussed in more detail. But it also goes by other names. Some have referred to it as a US, one China, two governments policy. What differentiates the, um, the um, soft balancing school of thought from uh, normalization is that the soft balancing school is a more normal relationship, more normal in the sense of uh, it, it, uh, adherents would not question a US, one China policy, but at the same time focuses um, much less on symbols of sovereignty and most on legitimacy focuses on balancing legitimacy in the Taiwan Strait in a conscious manner. This school of thought was, I would almost, had almost become uh, dominant, let's say in the 1960s, in the debates over whether or not we should recognize the People's Republic of China. There was a strong constituency that said that we, um, we can actually have diplomatic relations with both sides. Um, not by focusing on the two sides as states, but by focusing on the two sides as governments. Uh, Beijing, of course, didn't like this, and that's why you'll see reference in the 1972 communique, if I'm not mistaken, to um, uh, uh, Beijing's unilateral statement saying that we shall not, um, we don't believe the United States should have. Uh, they refer to it as a one country, two governments policy, but one China is a better way to characterize it. But it was dominant um, between 1972 and 1979. We had relatively normal relations with both sides of the Taiwan Strait from 1972 all the way up until 1979. We had an embassy in Taipei. We had a formal diplomatic representative or a, a formal liaison office in, in Beijing. Uh, we had two presidential level visits to Beijing. We had a vice president uh, uh, visit to, um, to Taiwan. And so just in terms of framing these things, in, in my view, um, these last two schools of thought, normalization versus uh, um, soft balancing, warrants um, a, a lot more discussion, particularly in civil society, in terms of what's the best route. So it's, um, in this sense, it's no longer a question of whether or not we should move toward a more normal relationship with Taiwan or the, or the Republic of China, um, but how. So I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mark. So thank you so much, our panelists, for all the questions. I mean, given the broad range of topics that we've covered, I mean, it seems very clear that you know, when we're talking about the current debate on U.S.-Taiwan policy is that the spectrum has very much widened uh, since 1979. So I want to do uh, a very quick round of questions with our panelists and sort of ask their thought about, you know, do they think this spectrum of debate um, uh, of U.S.-Taiwan policy, you know, what we've talked about, the diplomatic aspect, we've talked about the military aspect, we've talked about the strategic aspect as well. So do they expect that this spectrum is going to continue to widen or narrow when we come when it comes to the debate on U.S. Taiwan policy um, in the coming years, so very quick answers, please. Um, I'm going to start uh, from the right hand side this time. If anybody has quick thoughts, uh, quick quick thoughts. Um, uh, again, looking at these last two two schools of thought, one of the things that's been lacking um, has been, and at least to indirectly address your question, has been if one wants to move toward a more normal relationship with uh, um, the Republic of China uh, or Taiwan. There has to be a, a solid rationale defined in U.S. interests about why we would want to even consider a fundamental change in our policy. It's easy to say, oh, we should um, uh, establish diplomatic relations with, with Taiwan. Much harder to be able to explain and develop a consensus for why. And I think that is probably the biggest priority, particularly at, uh, within civil society, you know, the, the, um, um, to be able to Im, uh, inform the debate. Um, I was following up on what Mark said. I think uh, 
the debate will widen because for precisely this. Why do we want uh, a good relationship with Taiwan when we have such a horrible relationship with China that's getting worse? And I think as the, as the uh, relationship with China becomes more and more intense, uh, not just in trade, but in, in the military realm, in uh, North Korea, in Iran, uh, the Belt and Road, I mean, this sort of new Sino-Soviet alliance, which is now a new Belt and Road alliance, all of these things, I mean, not to mention the Wall Street Journal just filled today with uh, espionage, Chinese espionage and cyber. And you look at um, uh, the debate and you say, why are we being nice and deferential to this country which, which hates us? When, and when we're basically snubbing a country that loves us and would like to help us vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Chinese. So I think that uh, Tiffany's question is, is this debate, is the, are the terms going to be, is the spectrum going to broaden I think the, the answer is clearly yes, it has to broaden because U.S. public opinion is going to be in the sense that it is going to be um, uh, supportive of it. Um, I don't know if this is the place to stop it, but uh, yeah. Let's turn I'll to the other panelists. Um, to answer Tiffany's question, the spectrum of issues has definitely narrowed, particularly since it's been a quarter of a century since we've had the Taiwan Policy Review of 1994, as it was testified from the State Department to the Congress. Now, that was not a major, fundamental, broad, you know, rethink of U.S. policy, but nonetheless, it was an attempt to at least have a review. Um, there has not been one since then. The spectrum of issues has narrowed in a sense to not just narrow, you know, sometimes petty, trivial questions, um, but nonetheless with significant consequences, but it's also gotten very, very short term in our outlook. Um, going from, you know, crisis management to still, you know, to things like delays and delays on notifications of arms sales to Congress for, for um, that actually have you could argue actually violated the TRA because the TRA, Congress, again, I have to go back to say Congress is brilliant in the way it crafted the language of the TRA in order to express the congressional intent. And some people have forgotten, and I need to remind people that the TRA specifically called for the determination of defense articles and services provided to Taiwan determined by Congress and the president based solely on their judgment of Taiwan's needs, not the calendar of events that we might have with China, um, not some summit, not trade talks or, or human rights talks or climate, climate change talks. So we have fights over notifications to Congress. We have fights over you know, visits by defense minister, foreign ministers, or so-and-so. We've had day-to-day you know, -day struggles and, and uh, demarches. 14 years, we did not have a cabinet rank visit to, to Taiwan. People started to forget that that was U.S. policy for a long time to regularly have cabinet rank uh, visits, official visits to Taiwan. And now we have a, another gap that has now been five years. So what we, and of course, you know, not to mention something I worked on and other people did too, uh, when you talk about narrowing of even something uh, for the economic side to beef and pork and rectopamine. So again, I come back to my um, overall setup of, of um, the context of what we're talking about, which is why this, this discussion is so useful to be forward looking. So again, do we need another policy review after 25 years? If we want Taiwan to have urgency in enabling its sufficient self-defense to meet the current threat from the PLA, which is very, very different from what Congress talked about in terms of the threat to Taiwan from China back in 1979. It is very different today. If we want Taiwan to have the urgency to move towards asymmetric warfare, where is our urgency? If we're looking at you know, just the day-to-day -day short-term fights you know, within the interagency process and between Congress and, and the executive branch, between Taiwan and between the United States or between other countries, do we also need to have more of a long-term assessment? Because at the end of the day, the situation is not good. 
we have official assessments as well as private um, assessments by think tanks and assessments in Taiwan that China is eroding the status quo. A peaceful resolution is more difficult today. The trajectory of the PLA's movements towards modernization and build up for potential invasion and attack of Taiwan is not good. We look at the continuing today um, coercion towards Taiwan. If the, these are the two choices we have, a status quo that is being eroded and a trajectory towards um, military invasion that we do not want to see, do we need to work towards, actively work towards some other outcome? beyond U.S. policy today, which is simply focused on one thing, and that is the process, a peaceful process. And again, if we have a strategy, what is our strategic objective? Our current policy approach is good today, but it needs to be better. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we're trying to struggle with a great question. I just want to come back to something Shirley mentioned of the Taiwan Policy Review as someone who wrote the first eight drafts, nine drafts, whatever, um, of it. I have a very clear memory of that. And it strikes me to, that it's worth going back and saying, why did we start the Taiwan Policy Review? And the answer is two things. One, F-16 sales. We had taken the hard choice to dramatically increase our arms sales to Taiwan because their Air Force was falling out of the skies. Uh, and thanks in large part to Ambassador Lilly, we made the hard choice to move forward on that. Second, Taiwan was a natural candidate to enter what was then the GATT, is now the World Trade Organization. And, everyone, and so it applied and we were managing that entry process. At the same time, we were trying to keep the PRC from blocking them. And because of those two issues, one international organization commercial and the other military, everyone in the US government wanted to get involved. And we had to figure out how to manage a policy that would enable that to move forward successfully. So what is our policy objective? It is, in my opinion, first and foremost, to recognize that Taiwan, not of its own making, is in a, an extremely dangerous and, more, and, by the day, more dangerous environment. It's not its choice, not our choice, it's that of Beijing. How do we change that environment? And second, is everything we are doing, and I mean literally everything we are doing with Taiwan, going to advance the peace, prosperity, and security of the, of the people who are on Taiwan, of those 23 million people that Shirley mentioned earlier? That, to me, is the dominant question. And I want to point out, if I may come back to the idea of real estate and direct your eyes, at least in your imagination, to a piece of real estate in Nehu, just outside Taipei. Um, I had the honor of signing some of the leases that enable us to build there. Um, it is a quite remarkably large building. It's not because the large building is dramatic. It's because a lot of U.S. agencies have a lot of things that we are doing every single day of the week with Taiwan because our values coincide, because our economic interests coincide, because our security and international organization interests coincide. And we are working together day after day very closely together on a broad range of things. So before we start thinking about what terminology we're going to use for the superstructure of our relationship, you know, um, we need to recognize we have a broad, stable foundation and one that is growing broader every day. And I would finally add, to come back to my point about the dangerous environment, I would argue that we are not looking in our Taiwan policy or in our East Asia policy to do things that are pleasing to, ta to Beijing. We are trying to figure out how to constrain Beijing's range of coercive actions. And as serious as the PLA actions are, and I completely agree with Shirley, equally concerning to me are the IT and cyber threats they pose. We've read a lot about their threats in New Zealand and Australia and even in the United States. Realize that all of those targets for them pale in comparison to Taiwan. How much is that threat? What's actually going on? How does Taiwan counter that? How do we counter it with them? 
also in international diplomatic. We've seen their threats there. But also, there are a number of things that they are beginning to plan and quite clearly do, as Marriott discovered, to constrain international corporations and international companies and their activities in Taiwan. We need to look at those threats, counter those threats, and build our partnership together in practical ways that, that yes, provide for our values, but even more important, make the present and future of the people on Taiwan more prosperous, more secure, and more predictable. Thank you, David. So it seems like we have a debate about the spectrum of the debate uh, on US-Taiwan policy. But what I thought was particularly interesting was that there was absolutely zero debate on uh, China's increased coercion against Taiwan and that Taiwan faces an increasingly precarious uh, outlook in the region. And there was also no debate on the need for a peaceful resolution, at least from the United States perspective. So I do want to go one more round, um, and I'm going to ask uh, panelists to do the impossible of giving even more concise answers. But a lot of the comments um, raised this as the question about, you know, what are the U.S. obligations and are the U.S. upholding its own obligations uh, towards Taiwan? You know, what more can we do and that can be implemented um, under the existing framework or is the existing framework insufficient? So if our panelists could indulge me and give me some quick answers to how they think we might uh, optimize U.S.-Taiwan policy. Uh, so we'll go one quick round, and then we will turn to the floor for questions. Let's try to address this uh, quickly. Instead of using the word obligations, I, I would use the word interests. Uh, why isn't U.S. interest? Why isn't U.S. interest to really to do a real Taiwan policy review? I, I'm not saying that the 94 one was, was real, but um, it, it didn't address some of the fundamental <laughs> questions. The the the, the the most fundamental of Taiwan policy reviews or cross-strait policy reviews took place right after, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, um, when the Nixon administration first came in early 1969, uh, and then also, and then when the Carter administration first came in in 1977. Uh, these were guided by um, uh, study, you know, directives, uh, you know, presidential study uh, memorandums, and um, and in, in these debates, there were good rationales for why we should. I mean, a real, I mean, just imagine we had normal diplomatic relationship with the, the ROC, and then over the course of years, it shifted gradually to uh, in a fundamental way. I would argue three reasons why we need to really review this and why it would be in the US interest to really to think deeply about our fundamental policies. Number one, objective reality. The objective reality is that Taiwan, under its current ROC constitution, exists as an independent sovereign state. Now, it may sound breathtaking to some, but. Um, it just uh, it, this is just so basic. Uh, I lived in Beijing, I lived in Taipei, and this is objective reality. Policy is a different issue. How do we? How, how um, and how do we? Um, uh, you know, the objective reality and policy are, are related, but but separate issues. And um, in, in my view, when you have a policy that is disconnected with objective reality, you're bound to have troubles. And in my view, this is the disconnect between objective reality and policy is one of the most fundamentally challenging. The Se second reason, level the playing field. If we really want to create the conditions for the two sides of the Taiwan Strait to sit down uh, and uh, um, resolve their differences in a peaceful manner, um, the United States should not be getting involved in the middle by any stretch of the imagination. However, there are things that we can do to help create a conducive environment, and that is by extending a greater balance in our relationship with both sides by uh, balancing legitimacy. Uh, so the two sides can sit down at a table uh, on basis of, um, of equality. I don't believe we should uh, be compelling uh, uh, the Taiwan uh, side in particular to do the, um, detract from either party's positions, whether it's DPP or KMT. Um, but uh, the US, um, I, I think, um, has, has um, it's in the US interest to do more to be able to balance um, legitimacy on both sides to create a level playing field. For thirdly, and lastly, fundamental principles. If you define our one China policy in a zero sum game, that is unofficial relations with one side, official relations with, with the other, in, in effect, we are extending legitimacy to uh, an autocratic People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party, and withholding at least equal legitimacy from one side if you interpret it in the zero-sum uh, uh, nature. What signal does this kind of does this send to the rest of the world? It should be no wonder that organizations like Freedom House are talking about a backslide in democracy. 
whether we actually legitimize autocratic forms of government and withhold legitimacy from a autocratic government that's uh, emerged into a full-fledged democracy. And I will cut it there. Thank you. Um, I uh, would say we should uh, look at the uh, basis and foundation of our U.S.-Taiwan policy on a what my wife who teaches in the Fairfax County Public Schools calls ODB, <laughs> original document-based um, uh, analysis. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, my wife, uh, we always say our policy is based on the three communiques. And has anybody ever read the three communiques? I mean, really? I mean, I have. How many people here read it as a matter of course all the time and say, you know, and I am perfectly familiar with it. The Shanghai communique was a, a, a jargon-laden, lengthy disquisition. It was just disgraceful. Um, it had one sentence in it about the U.S. You know, the U.S. side uh, asserts that uh, all Chinese on either side of the strait say there's one China and Taiwan is part of China. We do not challenge that administration. And then it went on to, to say something else. It says, we will remove our forces from the region as, uh, as, as conditions warrant. And it also in indicated, and I'm trying to remember what the exact terminology was, but Nixon said, you know, we want um, there to be a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue. And our, <laughs> our relations with Taiwan and our military relations with Taiwan will be conditioned on this. The uh, normalization communique said the same thing. Uh, this is in 1979, or actually 78. And it said, uh, uh, China reas reasserts. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a cold and I'm... It reasserts its fundamental policy of peaceful reunification. And the 82 communique says the same thing. You know, the United States will lessen its arms sales to Taiwan as, as time goes by. And we do this in recognition of China's uh, fundamental policy of peaceful unification. Now, I don't see any fundamental policy of peaceful, peaceful unification, uh, not peaceful unification, peaceful resolution. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to go back and, and uh, say that during the time we had a two China's policy, Kissinger met with Mao Zedong twice. The first time Mao Zedong said, you know, I don't know why it is you Americans are so interested in diplomatic relations with us. We have diplomatic relations with Soviet Union. Ugh. We have diplomatic relations with India. Ooh. And they're not half so good as our relations with you. And that was in November 73. And, and Kissinger said, oh, well, we'll try to work this out. In, in October 21st, 1975, Kissinger went back to see uh, Mao Zedong for the last time. He was on his deathbed, well, his sickbed. He was about to die in an act. And you know what Kissinger said, what, what Mao Zedong said to Kissinger? He said, you know, I'm going to heaven soon. I'm going to see God. And he said this. He didn't say, I'm going to see Marx, like Dung says. He said, I'm going to see God. And he said, when I get there, I'm going to tell him it is best to have Taiwan in the care of the United States. And Kissinger sort of rolled his eyes and said, uh, I'm sure he'd be very surprised to hear that from the chairman. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. And Mao Zedong said this. And, and we know he said it. We know he said the exact words. He said, I will go because... I, 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 I don't, Taiwan now is not wantable because there are only warlords there. And I'm a warlord. We're just all warlords. Chiang Kai-shek's a warlord. I'm a warlord. It's much, best to, much better to have it in the care of the United States. And then he said, and the reason for that is because God loves you and you and you. And he pointed to Kissinger and George H.W. Bush and Winston Lord, I don't know why, you know, he thought he was, no, he couldn't have. Um, and Kissinger just said, I, I don't know, I haven't met him. And I thought, 
really, this is a, you're meeting the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, he's on his deathbed, he's telling you that Taiwan should be in America's care, and you're saying that when he goes to Taiwan, uh, to heaven to see God, he's gonna give it to, you know, he's gonna tell God to leave it with the United States, because God loves you and you and you, and you say, I don't know, I've never met him. Well, this is, this is uh, uh, an indication that my time is up. And so I will leave that thought with you and I will move off to the next uh, discussion. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move back to the current debate. Any thoughts from Shirley or So I, I think if I can sum up what we need to do um, to answer Tiffany's questions, what more we can do. If I can sum up one thing, it is to have better strategic communication, not only from the United States, but also from Taiwan and perhaps even working together. The, the comment coming out from the Trump administration uh, uh, against China's bullying of American companies, calling that Orwellian nonsense, you know, that was a start. Um, and under that umbrella, let me just mention a few, few thoughts for, for um, you to consider. One is, you know, in terms of the trade relationship, we need much more focus on the economic side of the relationship. There's a lot of discussion about the security side and the political side, but right now there is this weakness on the economic side. And other people have talked about whether we need to really work on an FTA. We've heard all this before, you know, even in legislation, for decades there have been legislation referring to an FTA. At this time, one question is, are the TIFA talks failing? as a mechanism to resolve disputes yes. in order that we can move forward towards something like an FTA or a BIA. If we need a new mechanism in order to make progress and do things substantively and implement uh, what we need to do and resolve disputes, do we need a new mechanism? Now we can all come up with ideas and let me just throw one out, perhaps something like a strategic and economic dialogue. Secondly, China is currently dominating the international narrative with a fake narrative about Taiwan constantly. Taiwan, of course, needs to do a much better job of selling its own story. It is not for us to do, it is for Taiwan primarily to do to sell its own story. Nonetheless, a lot of people in this room who are, who are specialists on the situation in Taiwan, um, 2049, GTI, other places, uh, all of us at this, in this panel, we have our own role to play. And one thing would be to call on the US ambassador to the United Nations to actually counter this false narrative that China pushes at the United Nations, which affects Taiwan's role in international organizations. And this fake narrative is that somehow the, the answer was was um, determined at the United Nations about the status of Taiwan, which is not true. The resolution in 1971-2758 did not even mention Taiwan, let alone settle the status of Taiwan internationally. That is just a falsehood, it's fake. Could there be a role for the United States ambassador to the United Nations to counter that, um, that false narrative? Thirdly, um, we seem to have a new expanded set of interests when it comes to Taiwan. I completely agree with Mark that we are talking about U.S. interests here. And I noted a very interesting new statement coming out of um, official circles in official speeches, which is we also have an interest in Taiwan's ability to deter aggression from China in order to protect the free and democratic way of life of the 23 million people of Taiwan. So this goes beyond the simple, usual talking points about peace and stability and prosperity in the Taiwan Strait. Fourthly, I continue to go back to the TRA and the original congressional intent. A lot of that has been lost. I mentioned some examples earlier, um, such as you know, violating the, the terms of, of determining arms sales based solely on Taiwan's defensive needs. There are lots of other examples I can give you. If we go back to the original congressional intent of the TRA, such as there's no such thing in there about an unofficial relationship, there isn't. High level visits are perfectly permissible. We, in fact, we've had even cabinet rank visits since 1992. Fourth, um, do we need to relax the restrictions in our contacts with Taiwan's officials? This is something that needs a fresh look. Um, 
Fourthly, there's a lot of discussion in circles, especially about arms sales and other things, and, and the, the threat coming from the PLA and the need for Taiwan to have a stronger deterrence and defense. But there's another D word that is not so much in the policy discussion today, and that D word is dialogue. We need more dialogue in order to advance a peaceful resolution, which is ultimately in our interests. If we have not just deterrence and not just defense, but we also need dialogue across the street, what might be the U.S. role? Is there some role, for example, in facilitation? Mindful that we might not want to have anything that goes against the six assurances, which assure that we would not mediate and we would not put pressure on Taipei to enter into dialogue with Beijing. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, an excellent question. I'm going to differ with my colleagues on the word interest versus obligation. I completely agree with everything they said about US interests, and I'm perfectly happy to expand on that. But I prefer the word obligation, and I'll tell you why. Because I think our interests are real, but they reflect us. We also have an obligation to implement those interests in ways that reflect our values and advance the peace, security, and future of the people on Taiwan. There is an ethical, I know this is old fashioned, but I'll try it anyway, even a moral dimension to that, and I believe that's important. Um, the other thing we have not really talked about, and I think needs to be part of this discussion, is Taiwan, yes, sits in a dangerous neighborhood, but it also sits between Japan, the Senkaku Islands, the South China Sea, right in the middle of that. And I would argue that in the South China Sea, if China looks and says, will the US be as strong on Taiwan as they've been on the South China Sea? And their answer is, gee, I hope so. Um, because I would argue in the South China Sea, um, we haven't done what we needed to do and China has taken advantage. Do we want that as an example of what we will do on Taiwan? Um, I would argue the same thing applies in North Korea. It is a strategic environment. What we do in one place matters to what we do in the other. And that then leads me to my final set of thoughts. Um, policy and nomenclature is fine. I have no objection to it. Um, I have no objection to the issues of legitimacy. The issue, however, to me is much more of a practical one. What can we do that will advance the interests of Taiwan, and that means change the environment in which they operate. How do we make it clear to China that one, it needs to stop blocking every initiative, however indirect, for dialogue? It's quite clear to me the people in Taiwan and the people in Washington are quite ready for dialogue. Have been suggested, we've proposed alternate names. I notice even Wang Jinping is saying, let's come up with an alternate name uh, for the 92 consensus, fine. But are the people on the other side going to pick up the phone? If they're not, if they refuse to hear what we're saying, um, we have once again um, practiced our vocabulary to little purpose. Um, we need to change the hard realities. And that's where I come back to. It's not balancing. It's not legitimacy. It's what I call strategic strategy therapy. We actually have to stop start doing the hard work. We need, I agree with Shirley on the UN, we need to do it in the WHA, we need to do it in ICAO. We need to make sure that, and we need to do it by actually moving forward, implementing the FTA. It's not an issue of mechanism in my thought, it's an issue of political will. We have lacked the political will to actually do what we say we care about. And if we're going to signal something to the world, reality matters. If we actually do the hard steps, if we actually sign an FTA, if we actually work with Taiwan to improve their security, both military and non-military, at that point, I would argue that our counterparts around the world will say, huh, I guess Washington is finally serious on this one. Maybe we have something to work with. I certainly hope so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much and thank you for your patience for sitting through those two rounds of questions. Now I want to turn it over to the floor. I believe we have 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, so what I'm going to do is probably take two questions and then ask our panelists to address them together. So, sir. Okay. 
Uh, please wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself before you ask your question. Thank you. I'm a Peter Humphrey, uh, intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I'm greatly troubled by what I see as years of magical thinking. Uh, Xi Jinping, just in the last few years, has said he's taken Taiwan, and he said it. That's just in English. God knows how many times he's said it in, in Chinese. Um, and yet I see uh, no preparations for civil defense in Taiwan in case the invasion forces actually make it to the beach. There's a complete faith that we can stop them before they hit the beach. Uh, I see no hope whatsoever that the U.S. will come to Taiwan's defense if he grabs Kinmen and Matsu. I see little hope that the U.S. will come to his defense if he grabs the Pengu Islands. I see magical thinking, and I hate magical thinking. I want to know what it's going to take for people to get really serious about the bad scenarios that could be facing us. Thank you. And we're going to take one more question from the floor as well, if anybody else has one. Yes, sir. Uh, Richard Coleman, Customs and Border Protection, retired. Uh, it seems like Taiwan has a choice of uh, the United States economically and militarily or China and all the countries that China is now dominating into its circle of influence. Uh, politically, how does the DPP and the KMT um, coming down on their differences between the relationships between China and the United States and how do you expect that to play out in the 2020 election? Thank you. So we have two sort of related defense policy related questions. So I leave it, I open up to the panel. Please go ahead. Um, let me start and then everyone else can improve my answers. Um, first of all, Peter, thank you for that years of magical thinking. I'll footnote you when I use it because I promise I will. <laughs> um, and I want to talk a little bit, I want to use that as an opportunity to make a point, which is I think we are operating in this, the past of security, not in the future. And I mean that by the fact that we are not taking realistic measures, nor is Taiwan as far as I know, on its cyber defense or our own. We are not taking the steps we need to do to push back on China on that. We are not taking the steps to push back on fifth generation. In addition, on this purely military side, we are still in the air talking about submarines, aircraft carriers, and combat aircraft, which as far as I know are the military technologies we're moving out of rather than the movie military technologies we're moving into. And I think that's where we need to be and where Taiwan needs to be. Um, Richard, as for the question of the DPP and the KMT, I don't know where the 2020 election is going to come out. Um, my crystal ball is in the shop. I'll call you when it comes out. Um, and I think it may be largely based on domestic issues rather than cross-strait issues. But if you're in Beijing and you are paying attention to the issue of elections and how the people in Taiwan actually feel, um, I would direct your attention to a series of surveys that I believe have been done uh, at uh, Zhengzhou University at the political university over the past 15 or 20 years about the opinions of the people on Taiwan um, concerning cross-strait options. And it is clear that 60 or 80% of them, depending on how you measure it, whether 60% of them basically want status quo, another 15%, give or take, want independence. In other words, they don't want a closer relationship with China. If you are in Beijing, that is the domestic political reality on Taiwan that you need to be aware of. And if you're going to do this without coercion, that's what you need to figure out how to work with. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I think the, there are some good news. Uh, if I want to end with some good news. Taiwan and U.S. policy has greatly improved in the last couple of years. Whereas, um, for example, Taiwan now has a much more serious look in defense to work towards asymmetric warfare. We have an administration that has been very serious in looking at reforms in the military in Taiwan. We have much closer mill-to-mill um, um, -mill engagement between the two sides. It was close before, I don't want to mislead you, but I think it's even closer now. And the, this administration in, in the United States has changed the way that things were done before, where we are now accepting Taiwan's 
requests for for um, for defense articles and defense services instead of saying, you know, I don't see it and so it doesn't exist and play this game. Now we're actually re accepting them. Um, it seems to have fixed the problem of delaying uh, notifications to Congress. And please do not ever use the word package. I hate that word because it, it implied that the State Department was just holding on to a lot of pending programs and refusing them to send them up to, to Capitol Hill. Um, it is um, also, also heartening, I think, with good news that there is very strong bipartisan support in Congress and close working relationships with the uh, administration. So bipartisan, close, if there's anything that Washington could agree on, I think, is stronger support for Taiwan mm -hmm. in support of U.S. interests. And so I think that's, that's good news. But what does that mean? That means Taiwan has this opportunity today to strengthen its defense, its economy, its democratic way of life, and Taiwan cannot afford to waste this opportunity and to work to, for, towards a much more resilient economy and defense in as short a time as possible. Thank you. Okay. Any final thoughts? Very quickly, uh, addressing the issue of um, um, U.S. response to uh, PRC use of force, I, I would say the U.S. would almost certainly have to do something. Um, there are, I, I, we don't know, I, I don't think anybody has really thought, I don't think anybody knows. Therefore, this must be done. Well, um, the, the, there, um, I don't think there's, we, I think there are all reserves, uh, there are all options on the table. Bear in mind, Taiwan Relations Act, uh, calls upon the is in the U.S. interest to maintain the capacity to respond to use of force and other forms of coercion. In general, a U.S. Uh, policy response to PRC use of force will be shaped by six factors. Very quickly, number one, uh, what precipitated the use of force? What brought it on? Number two, what is the form of that use of force? Is it amphib what scenario are we talking about? Are we talking about an amphibious invasion? Are we talking about one of the coercive ones, like a, a maritime blockade or some kind of an air blockade? Uh, or like an island grabbing uh, scenario in, in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, number three, what else is going on in the world? Uh, uh, whether it's Korea, whether it's Middle East or wherever. Number four, what are the capabilities of Taiwan itself? I never would, uh, I would not sell Taiwan uh, uh, short uh, at all. It's really hard to get, uh, I think the context you're asking the question is a full scale amphibious invasion, but there's a whole spectrum uh, in between nothing uh, all the way to complete uh, um, uh, effort by authorities in Beijing to annihilate Taiwan. Um, number five, what are the capabilities of the United States? Have we actually maintained the capacity? Do we have, uh, are, are we prepared to have thought through how, what are the range of options that we would have, whether it's flexible deterrent options or a range of other things? And then finally, number six, what are the capabilities of Beijing? It is, I would, um, they, they're, they're getting good, but they're not that good. Thanks, Mark. And just, just a quick note, I would leave Jinmen and Matsu out of that question. <laughs> it is completely separate. It is not part of this discussion. Um, but I think we are much more serious in, in talking about you know, what kinds of things the United States would do and what weapon systems Taiwan's requesting, wh whether they're um, M1A2 tanks or F-16B fighters or, or Stinger missiles or whatnot, what, what that we're much more serious. Jinmen, Matsu, the offshore the, or, the two offshore the islands. Offshore that are within view of the PRC mainland. John, do you have any final I have, wrap up yeah, thoughts? Two, One or two? two things that I forgot to mention. When Mao Zedong met Kissinger and said, we are both warlords, I would rather have it the United States care. Today, Taiwan is not under warlords anymore. That, China is, but Taiwan isn't. So that's a completely different uh, uh, situation and we have to respect that. Two, um, I don't know that America has rethought its strategic interests in the Pacific since MacArthur. MacArthur basically uh, echoing George Kennan in his 1950 book called Traditional U.S. Foreign Policy. MacArthur basically said, our goal in Asia is to keep island Asia out of the hands of mainland Asia. That is an absolute sine qua non for America's security in the Pacific. And here we are 70 years ahead from 1949 to when, when, when this first came out to today. And you know what? That is still a, the, the, the best 
summary of U.S. interests in the Pacific that I have ever heard articulated. But we have to keep island Asia out of the hands of mainland Asia. And that's why we have this partnership with Taiwan. Uh, terrific. Well, that is a, actually a perfect segue for the next panel, looking ahead to the future of U.S.-Taiwan policy. But before we go to our coffee break, I want to thank our panelists for all of their insights and uh, giving us a lot of history and context today. Thank you so much. And, and I publicly want to, to uh, thank Mrs. Borzoi Kelly for, <laughs> for her... Uh, Oh, thanks, John. So we have a 10-minute coffee break, and please come back at 3.30. We will have a keynote remarks from Senator Cory Gardner. Thank you.
Uh, my name is Russell Shell. I am the executive director of GTI. Uh, today, it is my distinct honor to be able to introduce our next keynote speaker, uh, Senator Cory Gardner. Senator Gardner has served as the U.S. Senator for Colorado since 2015. He is a member of the Senate Energy and Natural Resource Committee and chairman of the, of the Energy Subcommittee. In addition, Senator Gardner serves on the Foreign Relations Committee and the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. He also serves as the chairman of the Subcommittee on East Asia, the Pacific, and the International Cybersecurity Policy. Among his many legislative accomplishments, one that stands out in particular for today's conversation is the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, uh, which aims to develop a long-term strategic vision and a comprehensive, multifaceted, uh, a, and principled U.S. policy for the Indo-Pacific region. Please join me in welcoming Senator Gardner. Russell, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I uh, truly appreciate the opportunity to be with uh, you today. Uh, thank you very much to the Global Taiwan Institute and Project 2049 for the privilege of, of being here to address this incredible, important uh, United States policy toward Taiwan uh, on the eve of the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, in fact, uh, today's, today's appearance, this opportunity to be here to provide uh, comments is an uh, anniversary. It's a homecoming of sorts. Uh, on April 17th of 2017, I addressed Project 2049 uh, Institute with a, with a speech concerning U.S.-China relations and U.S. policies in the Indo-Pacific region. In that speech, uh, just a couple of years ago, I announced for the first time that I would be introducing legislation called the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act. Uh, I called it ARIA and outlined the intent and the provisions of that legislation and effort. In particular, I promised in that speech that ARIA would unequivocally back Taiwan as our important security partner, including authorizing new arms sales and providing for enhanced diplomatic contacts with Taipei. Only 22 months later, Things sure do move fast in the U.S. Senate. Um, 22 months later, President Trump signed ARIA into law on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2018. The language regarding Taiwan and ARIA was, as advertised, unequivocal in its support in maintaining the growing uh, U.S. economic defense and diplomatic relationships with Taipei. ARIA established that it is now the policy of the United States to support the close economic, political, and security relationship between Taiwan and the United States. ARIA established, uh, signed into law, that the President should conduct regular transfers of defense articles to Taiwan that are tailored to meet the existing and likely future threats from the People's Republic of China. Finally, ARIA established that the President should encourage the travel of high-level United States officials to Taiwan in accordance with the Taiwan Travel Act. The landmark ARIA is a historic legislative accomplishment for U.S. policy toward Taiwan to stand alongside the Taiwan Relations Act that we are here to commemorate today, to recommit ourselves today. Now comes the hard part, implementing both the letter and the spirit of the law. There is, as the audience here knows very well, a significant and historic difference between the views of the executive branch and the legislative branch regarding U.S. relations with Taiwan. The congressional view, which ARIA supports and I am here to expound upon, is that the United States must consistently grow our relationship with Taipei. The reasons for this approach are self-evident. If our goal is to secure a free and open Indo-Pacific, we should look no further than the nation of Taiwan. Taiwan is a free, prosperous, and peaceful nation of 23 million people. Taiwan does not threaten its neighbors. In fact, it seeks to build friends around the world through generous contributions to good causes, such as global health. Taiwan respects the rights of its people. Freedom House just ranked Taiwan among the freest nations in the world, giving, a, giving it a score of 93 out of 100. Taiwan was just ranked the 10th freest economy in the world by the Heritage Foundation's 2019 Index of Economic Freedom. Adam Smith would have been proud of Taiwan's entrepreneurial spirit. Of course, we see a markedly different picture across the Taiwan Strait. Under Xi Jinping, China is imprisoning Uyghurs and other religious minorities, cracking down on civil society more broadly and discriminating against foreign businesses, including U.S. companies. It is increasingly evident through projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative that China cares little for building genuine alliances, but is instead, instead interested in securing unflinching fealty by corrupting elites around the Indo-Pacific, riddling already strained uh, treasuries with crippling debt 
and writing one-way contracts which benefit China and China only. And increasingly, Beijing's rhetoric and actions toward Taipei are becoming more menacing. Since the May 2016 inauguration of President Tsai, six nations have withdrawn diplomatic recognition from Taiwan due to pressure from Beijing. In his New Year's message this year, Xi Jinping again alluded to the possible use of force to reunify mainland China and Taiwan. As Project 2049's own Ian Easton wrote in The National Interest in September 2018, China's rapid military buildup is focused on acquiring the capabilities needed to annex or conquer Taiwan. Chinese publications euphemistically call this achieving national unification. He goes on to write, the war plan for fighting a Taiwan invasion campaign is tattooed on the PLA's corporate memory. It is something that has been indoctrinated and encoded into the minds of all top level officers. For them, the interests of the regime, not the people of China, are paramount. And their main strategic direction, supreme objective, is to end Taiwan's life as a de facto independent country. In doing these things, Beijing has the temerity to present these developments as consistent with the so-called One China policy, one which the United States acknowledges but has never accepted to mean anything other than the eventual peaceful reunification acceptable to both sides of the Taiwan Strait. So that leads us to the question of where we're at today, where we go with U.S. policy toward Taiwan. Where do we go from here? My answer is very straightforward. We must pursue every available avenue of cooperation with Taipei allowable under U.S. law. This must start with robust and regular defense sales to Taipei as authorized by the Taiwan Relations Act and ARIA. We must do so regularly and with a purpose to address Taiwan's defense needs in every warfighting domain, land, sea, air, or cyberspace. In fact, ARIA authorizes $100 million annually to enhance cybersecurity cooperation with nations in the Indo-Pacific. I also introduced legislation to create the so-called Cyber League of Indo-Pacific States, or CLIPS, to ensure regional cooperation against cyber attacks. I call on the administration to ensure that Taiwan is front and center in every single one of these efforts. Next, we must do more to expand and protect Taiwan's diplomatic space, including from Beijing's shameful attempts to poach Taipei's allies. In the 114th Congress, President Obama signed into law my legislation to direct the State Department to support Taiwan's inclusion into Interpol. In the 115th Congress, I proposed the Taiwan International Allies Protection and Enhancement Initiative, or Taipei Act, which would direct the U.S. government to develop a strategy to support Taiwan's diplomatic alliances around the world and to authorize suspension of U.S. assistance to nations that are taking actions to undermine Taiwan. I intend to introduce this legislation, this version of uh, legislation again, the Taipei Act, in the 116th Congress. I also call upon the administration to comply with U.S. law and to allow high-level visits to, of U.S. officials to Taiwan, starting with sending a cabinet official for the 40th anniversary ceremony in Taipei in April. Finally, we must expand avenues of economic cooperation with Taiwan. My ARIA legislation authorizes the administration to engage, requires it to engage in multilateral, bilateral, or regional trade agreements with partners that comply with trade obligations and respect, promote, and strictly adhere to the rule of law. The administration should certainly consider Taiwan as one such eligible partner and engage in free trade negotiations with Taipei, either in a multilateral or a bilateral format. Since taking over the subcommittee, a chairmanship of the subcommittee on East Asia and the Pacific four years ago, I've had the privilege to visit tai Taiwan three times. I've now met with President Tsai four times, including traveling last August to meet her in Los Angeles during her transit to Latin America. Each time that I have met with President Tsai, I found in President Tsai a like-minded interlocutor and a genuine democratic leader committed to peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. It is for that reason, this reason, uh, this dedication to peace, so why last month I led a, a letter with a number of my Senate colleagues to Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi asking her to invite President Tsai to address a joint session of Congress in the near future. As we wrote in that letter, President Tsai is a genuine democratic leader engaged in a struggle against an authoritarian and oppressive system that seeks to deny the Taiwanese people democratic rights and fundamental freedoms. Extending an invitation for President Tsai to address a joint session of Congress in this historic year for the United States, Taiwan relations would send a powerful message that the United States and the American people will always stand with the oppressed and never the oppressor. 
standing with the oppressed and never the oppressor. That should always be our policy toward our friends in Taiwan. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here with you today. I look forward to taking questions and having a further discussion. Thank you so much, uh, so much, Senator, for those uh, remarks. I think they were uh, covered a lot of ground. That um, actually, I had prepared some questions uh, for this moderated discussion, and I think you answered them uh, already. No questions. So. No questions. <laughs> right. But I do still have some questions left, though. And because you know the the focus of our conversation today is not only about looking at the current state, but we're looking at the future of uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations. And as you've noted, uh, Beijing has been intensifying its pressure campaign against Taiwan. Uh, so while the United States, especially this, uh, the Congress under your leadership and a lot of initiatives that you've undertaken, has done a lot to respond to these mm -hmm, challenges, mm -hmm. we seem to be always responding to the next provocation that China is uh, engaging in. Uh, do you think that this is a sustainable situation? And is there a way that the United States policy-wise, can get ahead of this? Yeah, thank you, Russell. Great question. I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, we will be introducing once again the Taipei Act is to really create that long-term strategy uh, as it relates to the U.S. Uh, efforts around the globe, outreach efforts around the globe, uh, for uh, how we uh, hope other nations uh, will treat Taiwan and what we can do to encourage people to continue uh, their recognition. I met today with the ambassador from uh, Guatemala. Uh, and uh, again, Guatemala had been under intense pressure uh, from China to uh, to stop recognizing uh, Taipei, uh, Taiwan, and, and that they have uh, resisted those calls. They've had a long-term, long-standing relationship, and uh, the United States needs to uh, reward our allies, uh, our friends, our partners uh, who are doing the right thing. Just as we have to have a strategy, we can't just sort of. Um, you know, float around and, and uh, do one-off uh, approaches. We need a comprehensive strategy. ARIA starts to build on that, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act. The Taipei Act will certainly complete that legislation, as it re that, uh, that strategy and platform as it, result as it relates specifically to uh, Taiwan. Right. And I have another question also is that, uh, what do you see as the role of democracies and especially democratic Taiwan in the U.S. free and open Indo-Pacific strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the Indo-Pacific, I mean, you have the, the India, you have uh, the nation, the world's largest uh, democracy. You look at uh, what we've been able to do, uh, the successes that they have been able to succeed in Taiwan with, uh, and uh, and democracy is, and those voices of democracy are an incredibly important thing as uh, China tries to uh, exert more and more influence through the region in a system that doesn't reflect the values of a democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, if you look at uh, if you look at what happened to uh, other nations. Uh, South Korea, uh, North Korea, uh, wasn't that long ago, de several decades ago, where uh, you could argue that North Korea was uh, better economically than South Korea. Of course, uh, as South Korea has moved, as they have developed, as they have grown uh, to a strong democratic nation, uh, then you can see what differences it makes to the people of South Korea, just as it has made to the people of Taiwan, just as it has made to uh, people throughout uh, the Indo-Pacific that enjoy uh, the freedoms of a democracy or democratic style of government. So. Uh, w without that type of governance, uh, it's easy to see how nations can turn toward uh, policies that uh, don't value human rights or the respect or the dignity of their, their own people. Uh, when we had a committee hearing uh, a month or two ago with the State Department saying that nearly two million uh, uh, people were now sentenced to re-education centers in China, uh, where you see a burning of, of homes that may be held by uh, that are occupied by Christians in China. This is concerning. Uh, it's beyond concerning. Uh, it's frightening, and we have to act. And that's what democracies stand up against, uh, and what we must continue to spread the reason for uh, for more democracy. Thank you. And, and you touched on this in your remarks, but I was wondering maybe you might be able to elaborate a little bit, but, but more on this. Um, there was a recent report that was authored by Dan Blumenthal mm -hmm. and uh, Mike Mazza of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, published by the Project 2049. And uh, in, in that title, it said it was the golden opportunity for a U.S.-Taiwan free trade agreement. And earlier, just this, this panel, this panel one, we had some speakers who also called upon the United States to uh, engage in free trade negotiations with Taiwan. Um, and so you, you mentioned this, that, you know, ARIA includes um, components of, um, you know, looking at bi multilateral, bilateral. Um, and this includes Taiwan, as you've said. Right. 
Um, so how do you see, you know, wh what do you see as the prospects of yeah. this type of... Uh, yeah, look, I, I had uh, strongly hoped that the United States would move forward with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, Taiwan was not originally a part of the, t the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but uh, had we entered into that agreement, then at some future point, it would have been, uh, I think, appropriate uh, when the agreement could, could be reached to include Taiwan uh, as appropriate in something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So uh, that didn't happen. I hope someday we can get back into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But I, I do think the language that we incorporated into the Asia Research Initiative that, that greatly builds and takes from the Trans-Pacific Partnership sort of trade standards gives us a good opportunity to enter into free trade agreements with Taiwan. Uh, and I think we should. I think we should look at it in multiple ways. If, if, if a bilateral uh, agreement is, uh, is something that is uh, the, in the best interests of both nations, then we should pursue that. Uh, uh, I, of course, support uh, multilateral engagements as well. I'd like to see a multilateral agreement. It's important that we do this. And I think uh, having that engagement on uh, international stage, the, the, uh, the, the strong economies of the globe uh, standing up for the same values uh, and uh, rules of the road, so to speak, sends an important message and really helps us craft a brighter future for everyone. Well, thank you so much for those efficient, very succinct and also very uh, direct uh, answers to, the, to my questions. Uh, the senator has a, a little time left uh, to take some questions from the audience. Um, I'm just going to take one round of questions, and then it's going to we're going to have to uh, uh, conclude the um, today's uh, discussion with uh, the senator. And it's really nice outside, so I apologize <laughs> if, I, if I'm it's keeping you inside. You know, it's <laughs> indeed okay, fantastic. Uh, the lady in the front over here. And please state your name and also as well as your affiliation. And please keep your question concise. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. My name is Li Yang. Uh, I think this, before you, there is another panel too. I think for both, I think emphasize the military or defense cooperation and maybe a little bit sense of democracy. But I don't really feel that how Taiwan will be improved under which system, the most important thing is I'm worried about a social value. Like America, you don't really have a democracy because they are controlled by corporate lobby interest group and the personal in interest or property right or human right will be lost in a minute or second. So, and there's no way America will resolve the problem of people's complaint and there's no record. So I just wonder, if the America can improve both in America, but also overseas, including Taiwan, about the social political issues, focus on social values and the uh, Okay, thank you very integrity. much for that question. We're gonna have, because of limited time, we're gonna move on to a couple of questions and then and then I'll have the Senator to respond. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman behind, uh, yeah, two gentlemen, and then we'll, that's uh, all the time we have. Uh, hi, my name is Garrett Van Der Wees, Senator. Thank you very much for all the work you and Igor here have been doing for Taiwan. <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, you talked about uh, helping Taiwan to preserve its international allies. Uh, you talked to the ambassador of Guatemala. One other major issue is Taiwan's international space participation in international organizations. At this point, the US only has a policy of supporting Taiwan's membership in international organizations that do not require statehood. Would you be in favor of expanding that and uh, changing that to a more inclusive uh, approach? Yeah, in fact, I think we've introduced legislation in the past that would include uh, Taiwan's uh, international participation. Uh, and, and I think we should continue to pursue that. Look, uh, we had a, a, I believe it was during a, a recent Ebola outbreak uh, a year ago or six months ago, uh, where Taiwan contributed a uh, million dollars to the World Health uh, effort uh, to, to fight and combat uh, the epidemic that was underway. Uh, and that's just one small example of the responsible leadership that Taiwan has shown, the responsible global leadership. In fact, I think Taiwan uh, is, a, is a global example uh, of the kind of leadership that we are hoping other nations would emulate when it comes to uh, standing up uh, in organizations that are uh, helping people around the globe, whether it's a disease, whether it's uh, other uh, opportunities uh, to counter um, bad actors too. So I, I do think it's appropriate and we'll continue to seek legislation to do just that. And uh, obviously uh, human rights are an important issue uh, for the United States. Uh, and uh, we can always do a better job in the United States. I think the current conversation in the United States over anti-Semitism uh, is an is a incredible uh, opportunity for us to root out uh, anti-Semitism. 
uh, and to put an end to hatred uh, of any sort, uh, but particularly uh, to focus on those anti-Semitic voices that have raised their heads. And that's an example of where we must do right. But uh, we value our, our freedoms uh, and we hope that other nations will value their freedoms as well. So uh, we will stand up for human rights around the globe because that's one of the human rights that we value the most in the United States is making sure that human dignity is respected uh, no matter if they live in Colorado, Taiwan, uh, or anywhere in between. One more. All right, we take the, the center has generously agreed to take one more round of questions. So this gentleman in front, I know he's been waiting to ask a question. And this gentleman after him, this gentleman over here on the left. Thank you very much, Senator, for uh, your leadership. You're uh, now our ARIA. Uh, my question is uh, specifically where uh, we are now, how you, you see where we are now, or what's pending in terms of uh, arms sales. Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, it's interesting. The first uh, uh, time I visited Taiwan was uh, 2004. Uh, and I can remember meeting with uh, members of the, the defense uh, uh, ministry and we were talking about certain arms sales. Uh, fast forward to uh, my election to Congress in 2011, and we were talking about some of the very same sales, uh, and that, you know, six, seven years later. Uh, what happens uh, with, our, with our, you know, it's the, the Taiwan Relations Act now, uh, the Asia Reassurance Initiative that allows these sales and encourages these sales to occur regularly. Um, if the United States delays, then it becomes a bigger and bigger issue. It becomes a bigger and bigger political issue, a bigger and bigger political hot potato, so to speak. And so the more routine uh, we do this, uh, the less politicized it is, the more regularized it becomes, the more expected it becomes. And I think that's what the United States should pursue. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to the actual specificity of the arms sales, uh, there's a, a saying in defense circles where uh, the, the, the quantity uh, has uh, its own uh, quality. Uh, and so I think that's something that we need to look at as well when it comes to, uh, comes to the defense of Taiwan. Uh, Michael Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. You mentioned the difference in congressional and executive views. Uh, this also seems to apply to the value of military alliances. The president has made several comments questioning the financial value of our military relationships with both the Republic of Korea and Japan. Presumably, people in Taiwan, the government, reads this kind of, uh, this, these kind of comments. Have they talked to you about it, or is Congress trying to reassure the officials in Taiwan that uh, we look on these as more than just financial uh, arrangements? You know, there's no doubt that these are, are far more than financial arrangements. These are a security arrangements for the United States and our allies throughout the region. And if you look at Asia, we have some of the largest standing armies in the world. We also have a, a bulk of our mutual defense obligations uh, in Asia. In fact, I hope, I hope one of the things they were reading was Secretary Pompeo's recent comments in the Philippines where he recommitted uh, to Article 4, Article 5 uh, of our agreement with the Philippines. And so uh, that was a defense agreement, making it very clear where we stand. The Congress has made it very clear in Korea as well. Passage of the Defense Authorization Act with uh, our express uh, support for continued presence of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and uh, we will continue to express that, including uh, this morning, I had a chance to visit with the Secretary of State once again uh, to discuss uh, Korea and uh, the, the opportunities we have not only to work with, uh, with the Republic of Korea when it comes to uh, our presence on the peninsula, uh, but our allies like Japan and the region. This is not just a one-to-one uh, -one relationship. This is a regional relationship, and our alliances uh, uh, are, are key to our security and our economy. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the Korea-U.S. relationship, it is a, a key piece of the architecture of our global security framework. Well, Senator, I know that you have a busy schedule and that you have to, I think it was given a hard stop at four, but you gave us two extra two minutes. Thank That's you, good. so I appreciate that, okay? Uh, please join me in, uh, in thanking thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Um, if you could please remain in your seat, we're about to start panel two. Uh, the title is Looking Ahead, the Future of U.S.-Taiwan Policy. Thank you.
got some red right here. Mine's just orange. Yeah. It's orange. Yeah. Oh, orange. Mine's more of a maroon. Jackson, water? Yeah. Right. Thank you, Marzia. And Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking around for our, our last and hopefully most exciting panel of the day. It's been it's been really remarkable. I know for many people in this room, we can we can really all talk about Taiwan and U.S. Taiwan relations for hours and hours and hours. And so, um, thank you for um, being with us today. And thank you to the Global Taiwan Institute and their staff, Russell. Um, you guys have been amazing. And thank you to Emily David and you know the Project Twenty Four Nine Institute staff for um, putting together this great event. So I'm pleased to moderate this event. You know, it's really looking at the future of US-Taiwan policy relations. Panel one, to me, was really the established authorities on, on US-Taiwan relations. And as we move you know, ahead, looking at the next 40 years, you know, how is this relationship going to evolve? And so I implore my, my fellow panelists to try and answer some of the questions that were asked um, from the first panel. So I'll give very, very brief and quick introductions. I know everyone has their bios and their agendas, but starting to my left, I have Ian Easton, research fellow with the Project 2049 Institute, author of The Chinese Invasion Threat, um, Mr. Invasion Threat, as I like to <laughs> refer to him as. And then I have to my left, Russell Xiao, the executive director of Global Taiwan Institute um, and a great friend and colleague of mine. To my right, I have David An, who's a senior research fellow with the Global Taiwan Institute. I like to nickname him Mr. F35, um, who wrote <laughs> a really, really excellent and compelling work and, and, and himself has done great work in the State Department and the Paul Mill Bureau Affairs, um, working on not just you know, F35s, but that and a lot of other issues. Um, and then to my right, I have Jessica Droon um, with the Center for Advanced China Research. And uh, you know, her and I have, I, I call her the vanguard of US one China policy. If you do not follow her on Twitter, I highly recommend that you do so. Um, if you ever have questions about US one China policy, please direct them to Ms. Droon. <laughs> um, and myself, I'm the deputy director of the Project 2049 Institute, and I have no greater accolade than that. So. Um, so to, be, to begin, um, there are a lot of words that are thrown out about U.S.-Taiwan relations, and especially when it comes to um, what Taiwan should be doing. And some of those words are you know, innovative and asymmetric and deterrence. Um, and I like to use those words and pose these questions. How can the United States be innovative in our policy towards Taiwan? How can the United States be asymmetric in our policy towards Taiwan? And Mr. Keegan had you know, thrown out the three Ds, deterrence, uh, what deterrence, uh, defense, and dialogue. So, oh, that was you. Excuse me. So, so Ms. Khan, um, <laughs> and and he 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 said well, they were echoing each other. <laughs> um, so I, I asked the question: How can the United States find the political will to implement a policy that engages with Taiwan to build deterrence, um, increase its defensive capabilities, and support the elected leadership? Um, and support the elected leadership in Taiwan in dialogue with the United States. And Ms. Khan definitely gave this charge, um, which was, how can US policy be forward-looking and strategic? Um, and, and so that's really what I hope this panel can answer at the end of it. And so if we don't answer it by the end of this, I hope one of you guys asks us again, how can the United States policy um, towards Taiwan be forward-looking and strategic? Um, so with that being said, I have a few questions I want to pose, and um, the first one are just to get the known knowns out there. Um, first of all, Taiwan is a flourishing democracy. Taiwan has a professional military. Taiwan has a high-tech economy that's embedded in global supply chains. Taiwan is a responsible stakeholder. Taiwan respects human rights and universal values to include freedom of speech, press, and religion. Um, so those are that's the current environment that we are operating in. And so I know the first panel discussed a lot about the Taiwan that we were dealing with back in 1979, but let's talk about the Taiwan that we're dealing with in 2018, 2019, excuse me. Um, so I want to pose to all um, different questions to my panelists. I'm going to change up the format and not ask everyone the same question, but ask all of you different questions. Um, and I also implore you to debate with each other um, on your answers, if you'd like. Um, so to Ian, have US interests and strategic interests towards China changed or evolved, and why? Um, David, to you, 
Um, could you define the current status quo in the Taiwan Strait? And does it serve the political interests of China's leaders, Taiwan leaders, or the US, or US leaders? Um, to Russell, I want to ask, what are the positive and negative attributes to the United States' current policy towards Taiwan? And, and to Jessica, um, does current U.S. policy towards Taiwan su support or reflect the, the TRA to the fullest extent of the law? And if you could focus a lot on the, the political and the, the social side of things, that would be great. I like being able to control this panel. <laughs> I feel like they're all going to get them some time to kind of think through their answers as I fill in a bit of the gaps here. Um, so Ian, if you can tackle the first question, um, have U.S. interests and strategic interests towards Taiwan changed? Uh, thank you, Rachel. That's a very good question. And I think the answer, as everybody knows, is of course, yes, that our interests have changed because China has changed. Over the, fa over the past five years, we've seen uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party do things that were unthinkable, unthinkable five years ago, that China would go in the direction that it would go, that there'd be two million people. We, we actually don't know how many. That's just an estimate. Two million people in concentration camps in Western China. That China has taken all of the American technology that we've sold or co-developed with them or allowed ourselves to uh, be pilfered away through cyber uh, infiltrations and other infiltrations. They've taken our technology from Silicon Valley and from some of our best and brightest minds, and they've twisted it to create an Orwellian police state, because that's the direction that China is going in. That they have undermined our national security interests, they've undermined the national security interests of, of all of our democratic allies and partners, and now they're threatening uh, war with Taiwan, and by extension, war against the United States and our other allies. And that Xi Jinping just this, uh, just two months ago, to ring in 2019, would go on national television uh, in front of an audience of PLA officers and hundreds if not thousands of other members of the Chinese Communist Party and threaten, coerce, intimidate uh, the Republic of China, uh, Taiwan, uh, is absolutely remarkable. And so if you look at where we were as a community of analysts, those that uh, watched China, those that observed China's development, uh, and you would have asked people five years ago, what do you think, where do you think we'll be in 2019? Nobody, nobody would have guessed, not even the most paranoid analysts in the intelligence community would have guessed that we would be where we are today. And so that means, because we are here, unfortunately, it means we have to now treat China as a strategic competitor, that we have to wage what may be a new Cold War against China. And that has implications for Taiwan. It, the fact that, that China has treated Taiwan in the fashion that it has since Xi Jinping has come into power also means we have to rethink our Taiwan policy. We should have rethought our Taiwan policy long before that in anticipation of this potential outcome, but we didn't. Now it's imperative that we do to make sure that Taiwan and Taiwan's democracy can survive for another 40 years. You know, it's perfectly good that we celebrate 40 years of the Taiwan Relations Act and, the, and this wonderful relationship that we've been able to build up with Taiwan against all odds, because it really is against all odds when you think of where we were when we turned our backs on Taiwan 40 years ago. But now we have to think about where do we go from here? Because this is getting to be a very dangerous region and a very dangerous adversary that we face. Thank you. I know one of the issues one of the things that's often discussed about U.S.-Taiwan policy or Taiwan Strait or Cross Strait is the infamous status quo. And what is the status quo? And I know I, I would say that Beijing has a different idea of what status quo is. I'm sure the United States does, and I'm sure Taiwan does. And I know President Tsai recently came out and said, well, status quo is peace and stability. Um, and so, David, I wonder if you can, in your, in your opinion, how do you define the status quo? And should we keep talking about it in the way that we have been? Sure. So, um, you know, what is the status quo definition, and is it in the interest of U.S., Taiwan, or China, or, or all of the above? So, uh, the way it's used in policy is it's used more loosely, like you said, with uh, Thai peace and stability. Um, I think that's also generally how the U.S. government uses the word um, status quo in the region, like prevent war as an outcome. But I'd like to caveat that um, the status quo, although it sounds really um, 
like beneficial for peace and stability can be detrimental for Taiwan if China uses non-military uh, means influence Taiwan. So uh, with um, media and disinformation and um, economic leverage over Chinese businesses, um, it's, it can take ways, it can take approaches uh, akin to ancient um, Sunzi uh, in the art of war, Sunzi Bingfa. Uh, the highest level of victory is to win without fighting, right? So um, we're looking at that situation and then we see that China is taking these various uh, methods while the US and Taiwan is talking about the status quo. Um, but, you know, let's look at the status quo because it's a hard um, definition to grasp in policy. Let's look at it based on what it's not. And I turn to academia. So in academia, when um, professors talk about status quo, uh, like Kenneth Walt, the, the late Kenneth Walt, Stephen Walt, Charlie Glazer, Tom Christensen, um, they don't mean it the way that we mean it when we talk about status quo. We mean like an international environment, the current political conditions, will there be war? When academics talk about status quo, they mean you're either status quo or you're revisionist, okay? And uh, revisionist means you're trying to change the international system. The way the distribution of capabilities, you're trying to change the legal framework, the distribution of norms. Um, and so basically when you're looking at that definition right there, you're seeing that, uh, you're seeing where the US comes in and then says in the 2017 national security strategy um, that China is quote unquote revisionist. And in the academic literature, uh, the key example of a revisionist country in history is Nazi Germany. So to me, when I saw those words in the White House's national security strategy, to me that was very eye-opening. So when we look at status quo, we're talking generally in a policy sense of like, uh, you know, will there be war? Let's try to prevent war. But academics talk about it as argue status quo, not is it status quo. So with China being, you know, inherently what the White House calls revisionist, not status quo, it's hard to have a status quo condition when the country you're working with is inherently not status quo as as who, what it is. So I'd like to differentiate that, the condition versus um, you know, who you are, um, to, to bridge that gap between the academic literature and shed some light into the policy literature. So in the policy literature, are you recommending that status quo shouldn't be used? Um, I'm saying that this is really different. Um, and I'm saying that like the way the academic understanding is, you're either status quo or you're revisionist. And um, White House coming in saying, China's not status quo. So mm -hmm. we're trying to maintain the status quo. Taiwan's trying to maintain status quo. The US government's trying to maintain status quo conditions with a country that is inherently not status not quo. That's a, that's a problem. Right. So. Thank you for, um, for that. And Russell, moving, moving over to you, and I swear this is my last question about current US policy. But again, I want to talk about there are positive attributes to current US policy towards Taiwan. Um, but I think those. There's also have been unintended um, negative attributes or, or challenges to it. So could you speak a little bit to that? No, thank you very much, Rachel. And, and before I begin my remarks, I just want to thank Project 2049 again for taking the lead in coordinating today's conference. Uh, I especially want to thank Emily David, whom I know was busy emailing people at midnight this, uh, tonight, <laughs> uh, early this morning, because I was on the receiving end of one of those while I was asleep. Um, I also want to thank Rachel Yu and as well as my colleague, Marcia Versailles Kelly, for their incredible hard work in putting together today's uh, event. <clears throat> I think, Richard, you framed the issues uh, beautifully. Um, but, you know, I think rather than, you know, sort of taking it on sort of independently of one another, I think I want to address the issues holistically. And I think this, the question that we're essentially asking ourselves is, what's wrong with our Taiwan policy? And if it ain't broken, uh, then why fix it, right? And allow me to make three quick points, and I think, and I'll build on them. The first point I'd like to make is, I don't think that the policy is broken. But I think due to wear and tear of the policy grind, uh, it needs to be recalibrated. The second point is that I do believe that we are, like Shirley had mentioned early, uh, in the panel, uh, that we are going in the right direction. But I think we need to remagnetize the compass needle. The third uh, point I would like to make is that we need to shift from a reactive to a more proactive stance in our policy towards Taiwan. Now, let me tell you what I think why uh, those three points, I, I make those three points. The first point is that I believe that the current framework for the trilateral relationship between Washington, Taipei, and Beijing needs to be recalibrated. The relationship between Washington and Beijing has had a disproportional influence in how the United States conducted our unofficial relations with Taiwan. While I know that Shirley has taken issue with the term unofficial, uh, 
<laughs> Nonetheless, it has been the practice of, uh, of statements made by officials uh, to that effect. While the US and Taiwan policy maintained the status quo has been constantly changing because the status quo isn't static. And as David mentioned earlier, when you have two parties trying to maintain the status quo and foreign party changing it, that's already a very lopsided equation where there can't be some type of, there's no common definition at this point at which we're working from. So it's almost a terminology that has outlived its utility in some ways. And I think that was the question that you were going at. Uh, thirdly, uh, the massive military buildup across the strait by the People's Liberation Army and the CCP uh, political leadership's unwillingness to, refu um, to, uh, to renounce the use of force against Taiwan is clearly a threat to peace and security in the Western Pacific area. I, I think while the United States has maintained uh, an ability to deter Beijing from taking destructive military action, uh, largely because the latter has been relatively weak, Ian has uh, written in a, a fantastic book on this issue of Chinese uh, invasion scenarios. But I, I think that you know, this, this approach kind of risks inching dangerously closer to a situation where the benefits, where the risks outweigh the benefits as PLA, PLA modernizes and if Beijing's political leaders determine the need to, do, uh, to take action against Taiwan. And so as the PLA grows stronger, I think a perceived lack of commitment by the United States to defend Taiwan could for further embolden Beijing to use force to resolve the Taiwan issue. Essentially, what I'm saying is that what I think is, what I think is needed is greater clarity of US commitment to defend Taiwan and demonstrative commitments by Taiwan to its own self-defense, of course, uh, and these are going to be critical for purposes of deterrence and stability. Now, the second point that I was making was that we are, we are going in the right direction. And the reason why I think that we are going in the right direction is because there is, I think, a wide latitude for policymakers and relationship managers to work, to grow this relationship within the existing legal framework. But I think that this requires an affirmative policy of soft balancing by the United States. Uh, the U.S.-Taiwan relations are stronger than it's ever been since 1979. I think that's a fact. This is a function of Taiwan's democratization, China's increasing belligerence, and also of the growing trust between Washington and Taipei. Now, it's perhaps worth reminding ourselves, and Shirley did a wonderful job of doing this in this morning, that the only legal printing of U.S. policy towards Taiwan is the Taiwan Relations Act. Yet, U.S. policy towards Taiwan over the past 40 years has operated on the premise that America's primary interest is in the process as opposed to the outcome of resolving differences between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. I think this design was inherently a reactive as well as a passive approach that intentionally ceded the initiative of shaping the ultimate outcome to the other two parties. It was an approach that I think some policymakers in the United States expected would create a fait accompli and one that provided Washington with the flexibility to respond to significant geopolitical challenges like the Cold War with the Soviet Union while maintaining, trying to maintain stability in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but despite, I think, a lot of expectations to the contrary, Taiwan thrived, became a democratic um, government, and liberalized from the top down while an active society, civil society, pushed for political reforms. Um, Taiwan evolved from an authoritarian government to a vibrant democracy. And support for Taiwan and democracy uh, within, the, uh, within the United States is stronger than ever. What, yet, we are faced with a growing power disparity between Taipei and Beijing. And I think some would argue that undue deference by Washington to Beijing's sensitivities, which has gradually eroded some of the original commitments made under the TRA and also uh, President Reagan's uh, six assurances. And as this power disparity widens between uh, the Taiwan and China, a policy that's purely based on a a ambiguous process, which is peaceful insofar that there is no outright war, is going to be naturally going to come under strain, uh, which is leaving Taiwan now more susceptible to coercion, as it's clearly on display on China's multifaceted pressure campaign. And also, it could embolden Beijing to use military force. Um, indeed, I think PRC's coercive campaign, short of war, is aimed at gradually and unceasingly pushing for its desired outcome for Taiwan. I thought what David said earlier about, um, you know, the sort of the, I think what he didn't specifically call the gray zone operation, but I would call it the gray zone operation in the political sphere, is that it is constantly changing the status quo and it has, and it can have this effect of basically um, uh, 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 of, of disrupting 
um, you know, stability without actually eliciting uh, a response because the, special, the definition of the thresholds of responses are, are different. Um, I don't believe that, you know, I think uh, a policy that has to fundamentally extend greater legitimacy to democracies is the, the key to an affirmative uh, Taiwan policy. Um, I, I have other sort of uh, comments that I want to make about this, but I want to leave some more time for discussion. So I'm going to hand it over uh, back to you, but um, talk more later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I do have a multitude of, of other questions. You know, before I, I head over to you, Jessica, I think when we're talking about grades and activities, and it's something that the first panel addressed as well as how do how does the U.S. and Taiwan address new age or you know a multi-domain um, atmosphere where there are significant challenges that the CCP and the PLA poses to Taiwan's defense and to, and to the United States' ability to defend Taiwan, and some of those are electronic warfare, psychological warfare, cyber warfare, um, among just your con your traditional conventional warfare capabilities as well, and we will address all of those in just a few moments. Um, you did, uh, Russell, talk about the TRA, and so I'm going to move over to, to Jessica. And my, my basic question is, is current policy upholding you know, the TRA to the, extent, the fullest extent to the letter of the law? And, and where are areas that you see that there might be gaps or areas of improvement? Thank you, Rachel. Um, in my opinion, implementation of the TRA has been relative, relatively successful in regards to how it was outlined in the 1970s. The policy is dynamic. It allows for a dynamic Taiwan policy that is adaptable as long as it falls within the confines of our One China policy. We see this um, allow for a robust relationship with Taiwan in promoting democracy in military um, exchanges um, in Taiwan's economy and in promoting human rights and universal values. However, new developments um, have created two wrinkles that I see in the TRA. The first is that the in interpretation of the spirit of the TRA has changed. I think in the 1970s, Taiwan was framed as important in and of itself to the United States. But too often now, we see Taiwan through the lens of managing the relationship with China. We have often become too reactive or oversensitized to even the potential of a negative Chinese response to any policy options regarding Taiwan. And of course, we need to always assess China's reaction in, in the sense of whether it would be harmful, perhaps too harmful to Taiwan counterparts or to broader interests. But China has learned to air its grievances for even the smallest of things, and we need to go back to the original intention of focusing on Taiwan for Taiwan itself. The second is that the operating environment for triangular relations between Taiwan, the United States, and China has expanded beyond the Taiwan Strait region. We all, all three have vested interests in, for example, international organizations or in far-reaching global regions like Latin America and the South Pacific. And we need to incorporate these these elements into a broader strategy. I, as you move forward, I think the largest issue, a wrinkle, I think the wrinkle is a good way of putting it with the TRA, is really looking at the elements of how, how is the United States government you know, supporting the people of Taiwan and supporting, and supporting its democratic institutions. And I think that's where you see our US Congress you know, passing things like the Taiwan Travel Act and passing things like ARIA, passing things, or hopefully maybe passing things like the Taipei Act, which hopes to induce, I think, a sense of legitimacy to the government of, of Taiwan. And so I wonder if you can, if you can pose a little bit of your thoughts on on how the TRA is enables U.S. policy to extend more legitimacy. Um, what do you mean in terms of legitimacy? It's a good question. I think, as Mark would say, great question. Um, <laughs> I think legitimacy is either is it is is the ROC is the elected government of the ROC legitimate? It's a loaded question, and I guess it would depend on who you ask. But I think the nature of the relationship between with between the U.S. and Taiwan varies from the nature of the relationship between the U.S. and China. One's a peer, one's a competitor. And that in and of itself requires different approaches and strategies. Like I mentioned, um, you know, Taiwan has vested interests in international organizations, and with China's growing 
international reach, you see China placing key figures within targeted organization that Taiwan's trying to participate in, such as IKO. And you see even non-governmental organizations with Taiwan representatives being pushed out of um, these international organizations. So I think one thing that the US can do to extend legitimacy to Taiwan is to incorporate Taiwan into its broader strategy towards how it approaches international organizations or how it um, navigates its diplomatic relationships in Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, I could jump in on legitimacy. So um, I'd like to differentiate between the term legitimacy and sovereignty um, because Mark Stokes mentioned a bit of that earlier when he talked about objective reality here. Um, so with legitimacy, um, basically Taiwan is by definition a legitimate government because it has it goes through its leaders are elected through free and fair elections. So that is really what differentiates you know, Taiwan and other democracies from autocracies, which generally is considered not legitimate because it's not the will of the people. So I'd like to differentiate that. So by definition, yes, Taiwan's government is legitimate by, by the common de definition of academic literature about uh, elections. Sovereignty issues, and we're talking about you know, what um, Mark was saying, the de jure versus de facto um, issues. Then, by definition, you know, um, the textbook definitions of, of sovereignty is uh, population, geography, possibly a government uh, ruling over it, even though Somalia, that's, that's a maybe because Somalia is recognized as a country but doesn't have a functioning government. And then for uh, international recognition in uh, international organizations and the UN. Um, so with Taiwan, uh, with the number of diplomatic allies dwindling, um, then that's one way that the U.S. can be helping uh, Taiwan. And we heard with the senator that the U.S. is helping uh, Taiwan by recalling U.S. diplomats or U.S. ambassadors from countries that had broken off relations with Taiwan, uh, ways that the U.S. can help Taiwan in that sense. Well, and if we're honest, I think Taiwan's all, clearly also a sovereign country. I mean, if you believe in what followed the Treaty of Westphalia, then what did that say? That said the countries that, that have a border, that they reign supreme, that they get to administer what happens within their borders, that other countries just can't invade them on, on religious grounds, which is why we had the treaty in the first place, or other grounds, that they cannot be invaded from the outside, that they have authority within their own borders. And so if we still believe that the Treaty of Westphalia holds, and I think everybody does believe that, then of course Taiwan has sovereignty. Of course the government of Taiwan has authority over what happens in its own borders. And by definition, that means that it's a sovereign country. Now whether or not the United States government recognizes that, because of course the United States government does not have a, a, an opinion on this, not officially, that's a completely separate matter. That anytime there's a civil war, as there was in 1949, and you have a split, and we saw this with, with Germany, where you have East Germany, West Germany, we, saw this, we still see this in the Korean Peninsula, with North and South Korea, that the United States government shies away from, from issues of sovereignty. We also do this with the Senkaku Islands, the Diaoyutai Islands, right? But the fact that we shy away from it in the policy realm doesn't change the objective reality on the ground, and that is, of course, that, that Taiwan is a sovereign country. Well, let me to jump in also here, uh, because I think this relates to my third point, which I wanted to make, which is that we need to shift from a more a reactive to a more proactive policy. And I think extending greater legitimacy uh, to, a, to democratic Taiwan is really the fundamental first step to that. And I think that a new Taiwan policy, if we can call it that, must not only ensure that the process is peaceful because the, the status quo is constantly changing, and that can't be the metric by which we define stability, right? If we're maintaining the status quo equal stability, that's... That's just a, 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 a misnomer, right? Um, but at the very least, I think what we need to be able to provide is an alternative vision that at the very least reflects the objective reality that two legitimate, non-subordinate political entities currently coexist in the Taiwan Strait. I think this is important to make this point because there are scholars as well as former policymakers who have floated the alarming idea that we need to accommodate China by reaching some sort of a new modus vivendi uh, with Beijing. Um, which could effectively abandon Taiwan. I think this is an outdated as well as a flawed premise, uh, which is based on the tendency to construct events in Taiwan in binary terms, either independence or unification. For Beijing, only unification or else war. In other words, this is a Hobson choice. For those who are not familiar with the expression, 
Mr. Hobson owned a stable of horses who would rent out his horses, but he had a rule that prevented people from riding his best horse. They could only take the horse that was nearest to the stable door, or they could take no horse at all. So what Beijing is offering is really no, no real choice, or well, at least that's how they frame it, right? So the primary goal of US policy has been up across your relations is to ensure that the resolution is not coercive, unilateral, or detrimental to US interest. But the situation now can be arguably said to be more coercive, with China acting more unilaterally, and this is increasingly detrimental uh, to the US interest. So therefore, a recalibrated Taiwan policy must not only ensure a peaceful process, but at the very least provide an alternative vision that reflects the objective reality that two legitimate, non-subordinate political entities currently coexist in the Taiwan Strait. This must be the starting point. It is arguably that the case that while previous ambiguous approach has been effective in maintaining peace for the past four decades, I believe that this has outlived its utility. The legitimacy gap in the Taiwan Strait is being exploited by Beijing to isolate Taiwan from the international community and interfere in Taiwan's domestic politics. And this could have the effects of emboldening Beijing and also pushing Taiwan into a corner. I, I think there's certainly um, the alternatives to a gradual change pre presents very destabilizing proposition. And of course, you know, there's a great deal of uncertainty that comes with any kind of change. But I think even the fear about thinking about change can lead to a state of paralysis, which would be equally disruptive in the Taiwan Strait. I think sustained high level discussion is needed now more than ever before between the United States and Taiwan to determine a new optimal equ equilibrium based on mutual obligations and interests that best reflects the 21st uh, century realities, not only the Taiwan Strait, but also global norms and values. I fully agree with Russell. I'm not just saying that because he's sitting right next to me and he's my neighbor here. Um, <laughs> it's fear. At the end of the day, the reason why we've had this policy for 40 years and we're terrified to think about the next four months, let alone four years, let alone 40 years into the future, and we're terrified to do anything new, and we have this lack of, of imagination when we think about the future, is fear. That we have been conditioned to believe by the Chinese Communist Party that if we do anything that might be in our national interest, in our national security interest to do with Taiwan, that that will result in war, and that we will be the cause. We will be the trigger of war. The, the expression that they love to use is, why would you pour gasoline on a fire? And everything we do with Taiwan, by their definition, from arms sales to high-level unofficial, but obviously in reality their official visits, uh, to a free trade agreement, to anything else, is by their definition pouring gasoline on a fire. It's insane because the path that that will lead us down is a path of extreme destabilization and in instability. If we continue to allow China to set the rules for us and define our own national security interests for us and to build up its military while we fail to respond, while we fail to protect our national interests, that takes us into a very dark future. And as a young analyst, we're all young uh, analysts and researchers on this panel, we have the luxury, we, we lack wisdom and we lack experience, but we do have the luxury of being able to hope that 30 years from now, 40 years from now, we'll still be around to be part of this game that is playing out. And when I think about what I would like to see 30 years from now or 40 years from now when I retire, if I'm lucky, is a few things. First, peaceful resolution, no. I don't believe peaceful resolution is possible as long as China is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party or any authoritarian government. I don't think that should be our long-term goal. I think our long-term goal should be to keep Taiwan out of the PRC or any other authoritarian Chinese government that might follow the current regime. I think our goal is also to deter war, to deter a Chinese attack on, on Taiwan that would precipitate a conflict across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and if we fail in deterrence, in preventing that, then our goal must be to win it, to win it, and to bring down uh, the current government in Beijing. 
And ultimately, what this will require is that we need to reestablish our diplomatic relations with Taiwan, because there's no way that I can envision deterrence holding over the next 20 to 30 years if we don't do that. Because if you look at all of the constraints that we put on ourselves, and they talked about this in the last panel, and you compare where we are with Taiwan and the government of Taiwan with where we are with Seoul or Tokyo or Canberra, there are remarkable gaps that are there. And that's destabilizing. When you don't provide ironclad security commitments, when you don't have troops on the ground, when you don't have skin in the game, when everybody is constantly wondering, will the US show up? Is the US resolved? We don't know. That's very dangerous when you know for a fact stated policy of Xi Jinping that he covets his neighbor's territory. He wants it. He wants to take it over. He wants to conquer Taiwan. That is stated policy. And so we need to make sure that we're very careful in making sure that his ambitions are never, ever realized and that our goals for the future are so that we get to 2049, we get to 2059, and we do have still a free and open Indo-Pacific. Because if we don't change the way we've been doing business, we won't. Ian, I think you make a great point in that uh, what we find ourselves when we're talking about Taiwan is that we end up only talking about a very short timeline. We talk about, like you said, looking ahead, you know, the 2020 elections and what is Beijing going to do. Um, a lot of a lot of folks in both academia and think tank worlds, as well as government, talk about urgency that there's not enough urgency on. Taiwan's end, and sometimes some would say there's not enough urgency on the U.S. end in making the point that, you know, is Taiwan really under threat? And obviously the answer is yes. And so a, a, one last round of questions before I open it to the floor for um, each of my panelists here is, you know, one for you, Ian, is the, is the porcupine strategy, you know, the right approach for, for the defense of Taiwan? And for David, and this could also kind of like look ahead. So think about the porcupine strategy in the next, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. And David, for you, um, what is Taiwan's role in, in the U.S.-Japan alliance? And um, if, if you can discuss that. And Jessica, you, you, like I said, you're, you're, you're Miss U.S. One China policy. And so I want to I ask you a question about uh, Beijing's ability to have assert narrative dominance um, especially among journalists and among the way that the, the broader public discusses Taiwan. Um, so I'd be interested to hear some of your thoughts on that. And Russell, for you, if you can talk about CCP's political work, warfare activities um, direction, targeted Taiwan um, and taking note of United Frontwork activities and, and what that means. And again, kind of looking at what, what, how United Frontwork activities today reflect, uh, could reflect the policies of, of tomorrow guys a little bit of time, but Ian, if you want to take it away. So your question was about the porcupine strategy. I'm not convinced that that is a strategy. That's more a tactical, that's a tactical battle plan. These are, it's an advocacy for Taiwan not buying certain types of, of defensive capabilities and buying other types of defensive capabilities. And that's, that's a debate that's very well worth having, but a real strategy brings in politics, it brings in economics, it brings in diplomacy. And I think Taiwan security over the next 20 to 30 years is going to start and it's going to end with political decisions made in this city, in Washington, D.C. Because there's no other way that Taiwan can possibly prevent and deter a Chinese attack unless it, it develops secret, uh, a secret nuclear weapons program, which I think is very, very uh, unlikely and it could be very dangerous if it did and so that means deterrence has to come ultimately from the United States and so this is a political question there are all kinds of, of political questions that are involved in that a true a true strategy by definition strategy what is that strategy is the art of setting priorities and then enforcing those priorities right and so we need to have an idea of what our strategic objectives are and again I think our strategic objectives are to prevent China, the PRC, from taking Taiwan over, to prevent a war with China over Taiwan, and if a war comes, to make sure that we can win it, and ultimately to reestablish diplomatic relations with Taiwan, because if we don't do that, we won't be able to achieve our other objectives. David, so 
David, with, with those sort of priorities that Ian laid out in mind, what does that mean for the U.S.-Japan alliance, which is obviously one of the mainstays for um, U.S. forward presence in the region? Sure. Um, so with the U.S.-Japan alliance, I think we should go back, and it's harder to imagine these days to before January 1st, 1979, because we look at U.S. and Japan as this, um, this model uh, alliance relationship, um, but Taiwan li likewise um, before 1979 was a U.S. mutual defense treaty ally. Um, so there's that history there, that there's that cooperation, there's that, that trust um, you know, throughout the decades. So with that in mind, uh, on Taiwan's role with U.S.-Japan uh, alliance, I'd like to make two points. Uh, one is that a lot of cooperation between the U.S. and Taiwan, and also uh, Taiwan and other countries in Europe and possibly with Japan, is done uh, quietly. So you'll hear a lot of people um, who've worked on the issues within the U.S. government or Taiwan government um, a lot of former AIT directors or deputy directors will come to conferences and they'll say in public venues that you, you see a lot of U.S.-Taiwan security cooperation, um, but there's a lot that you don't see. And they mean that's a, that's a good thing. That means that there's a lot more, that's a lot more U.S. support for Taiwan, uh, likewise Taiwan with other countries. But that means that it's hard for us, you know, outside of the U.S. government, you know, without working on Taiwan issues, without a security clearance and a need to know, working specifically military issues, to really see the full extent. Right, so that's the first caveat: is a lot of cooperation is quiet cooperation. So there, even though you're not, if you're not seeing much between U.S., uh, Taiwan, and Japan, um, there there could be a lot more there. It's just you can't really see the data from outside. Second is uh, is um, the concept of shifting strategic environments, and I'd like to bring you to um, 1949 versus 1953. Like, what was the what was in the U.S. leaders leadership's mind toward Taiwan? when Taiwan had just lost the Chinese Civil War in 1979, right? And like Chiang Kai-shek's escape to Taiwan with his military. And then that, that, the US view of Ch uh, Taiwan or the ROC at that time was that you just lost the Civil War, right? And um, was really starting to back away. And then suddenly in the early 1950s, the US made Taiwan a mutual defense treaty ally. That was a huge change. And that was because of this st shifting strategic environment. That was because of the Korean War. Right, so um, I'm gonna bring in a, a third way to use the word status quo. I mentioned in policy, uh, peace and stability, this current environment. I mentioned in academia, you know, who you are. Are you status quo revisionist? A third way is the classic status quo bias of right now. Status quo bias is to say like how we're working with Taiwan right now is necessarily how you're gonna work with Taiwan a year or three years from now if the environment shifts. And what I mean is that you know, right now we're looking at Taiwan's situation and we're looking at a fairly peaceful Pacific, yet you, know, you see China's military modernization and what the US calls anti-axis air denial um, and concerns about anti-satellite warfare. And then you know, it's harder to imagine, but if that environment shifts more toward conflict, then Taiwan has a much more important role for interoperability, yeah. uh, potential for interoperability within the US military alliance because of its uh, military equipment and communications equipment, Link 16 on fighter aircraft. Mm -hmm. So I, I use the word potential because that's a politically sensitive term right now. Um, so you know you, you don't really want to say necessarily that they're interoperable, uh, interoperable today, but that they could be someday if that environment um, brings uh, the U.S. and Taiwan and U.S. allies in that direction. So those are my main points. You know, like let's not make the status quo bias. Um, let's look at 1949 versus 1953. And there's a lot of potential for the uh, Taiwan to be um, a really much more important partner to the US and US allies that are hard to imagine today. Jessica, how do we tackle the CCP's narrative dominance on Taiwan? So I just wanted to provide a quick overview by what you mean by that. Um, so a lot of what I, my research focus on, focuses on is the US one China policy. And in studying it, I found that China oftentimes tries to conflate our one China policy with its one China principle. And it does this not just in the United States, but with one China policies, um, emphasis on the plural, across the spectrum. So each country that has established diplomatic relations with China has its own one China policy. They vary across the spectrum to include deliberately ambiguous ones like the United States, Canada, Australia, and ones that their one China policy is the one China principle. Um, we see this stemming back to even the communiques. Um, the US states that it acknowledges the Chinese position. But if you look at the official, or I don't think it's official, but the Chinese translation on the AIT website, it says, which is recognize. Wherein the previous communique said, America 
acknowledges. So you get this effort to dilute the amb ambiguity and reshape public discourse on it. So you have people in Taiwan reading the Chinese translation. They think that the US position is the same as China's. What does this mean on the US side as well with um, Americans trying to get a better sense of where the US stands towards Taiwan? Um, I guess some initial thoughts is to always use the possessive when talking about one China policies, our one China policy, or add an adjective, the US one China policy, Mexico's one China policy, or to add um, indefinite articles instead of definite articles. A one China policy as opposed to the one China policy, which makes it come off as if there's only one. Um, I think this will help in shaping the public narrative. I oftentimes see um, US media misconstrue what the US one China policy is. And I think these are very initial steps in getting our narrative back to what we intended. Thanks. And speaking of a narrative, I mean, well, what are the ways that the CCP is actively working like, through front organizations to induce this narrative is through United Front Work activities? And Russell, if you can spend one and a half minutes talking about that, it would be oh, great. Well, that's, that's, that's rough. Then. Thanks, Jen. Um, this is a great topic. Um, really, I think United Front can be, uh, I think, simplistically, it's not a simple concept, but I think you can define it. Uh, in terms of a whole of government strategy, whole of society uh, strategy aimed at um, in mobilizing, indoctrinate, uh, indoctrinating non-CCP masses in pursuit of party-defined uh, military as well as political objectives. And uh, it is an undertaking, this is something that Xi Jinping himself has defined as one of the magic weapons of the Chinese Communist Party. Someone who's done some excellent deep dive studies on this is Anne-Marie Brady, uh, a scholar in New Zealand, who is under intense pressure right now in terms of actually some of the uh, uh, things that are happening to her where um, like break-ins to the house and uh, tampering with her cars uh, over some, perhaps some over some of the research that she is conducting on this issue. Um, but really, I think this goes to actually a broader strategy of sort of changing the, the status quo, right? And the way that they do that is uh, through, of course, uh, party apparatuses, but also working with pseudo uh, proxy organizations, political parties, um, engaging with a broad base of constituencies. I think in Taiwan specific, you know, targeted uh, constituencies include people who are fishermen, people who are farmers, religious organizations, spouses from, uh, from China, youths also as well, village leaders. These are very grassroots approaches, really trying to change uh, perceptions or manipulate cognitions or in ways of actually directing behavior, right? Because Taiwan is a democracy, people go to vote. And you know, at, this very, uh, at this very bottom tier level, and I'm talking about the, in the, sort, of the, the sort of the masses, the grassroots and the elites, you know, it's very hard for even, um, I think, national security professionals to be able to maintain or keep track of all these types of engagements that are happening uh, cross strait. And, um, and of course, because Taiwan permits still people to people exchanges, legitimate people people exchanges, uh, these, are, these kind of interactions are happening, um, you know, on a very, very, um, I don't think people understand how actually, how much engagement actually is happening between the two sides, despite the, uh, the, the shut off of high level political dialogues. And, and the, I think what's important to point out here though is that it's those types of, it's not legitimate public um, sort of influence, I think is something that we have to distinguish between uh, influence and interference. And I distinguish influence from interference because interference are not legitimate. You know, I mean, because interference, I think what a good sort of uh, 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 criteria that we can utilize to distinguish that are those activities that are coercive they are corrupt, and also they are covert. And I think that there are activities that China's engaged in, such as uh, bribery, uh, such as use of blackmail, and such, uh, and such use of proxy organizations, and uh, like uh, you know, astroturfing in, in, in Taiwan, because again, there's a free environment where people can establish organizations and can freely assemble. Mm -hmm. That you know, um, if you can't keep track of where the money flow is, there's a lot of these types of organizations that can you know spring up. Uh, and you know, maybe reflect public opinion, but really, uh, these are fronts. So are these are all the ways in terms of how the status quo is changing from a, from a political angle from the United Front. I think it's important to, to talk about Beijing's political warfare, to talk about influence operations, and ask the question, 
what what are its goals and what are its ends? And I think at the end of it is to propagate the, C the CCP's position on a quote unquote one China principle. And the way the United Front works to operate in that is to expel that through their overseas Chinese affairs work. Um, and, and, and you see that here in the United States, that the Chinese China Council for Promotion of National Reunifications you know, organizes um, both ethnic Chinese um, who are here in the United States, as well as Chinese Americans. And you know, they get together through these groups called the Chinese, um, Chinese Council for Promotion of National Reunifications. There are chapters you know, all over the country. There's a chapter here in Washington, DC. And so they'll, they'll organize, and they'll organize to protest against you know, President Tsai's transit to Los Angeles. And they did that, um, I think, in 2017. Or you, and, or you can ask the greater question. In you know, Washington, DC, we're talking a lot about um, concerns of, of China's or Beijing's interference in, in, in the United States or influence operations or political warfare activities. But no one's asking the question, to what end? And I think a good answer to that question is it's trying to influence and or influence US policy towards Taiwan to change the parameters of debate on US Taiwan policy. And that's really, I think, what this you know what this event and this panel is trying to do is to change the parameters of the debate to not allow Beijing why it's called Beijing's cognitive warfare to limit our options to limit what the United States what's in the United States interest what's the United States goals um, and that is my short spiel because I now have only left six minutes for our wonderful audience here but, to ask but a questions final point on that, Rachel, it's, not, it's not just a grassroots it's also elites right mm -hmm. it's targeting elites also as well so it's not for just sure. grassroots Right. So, yeah. um, and so I'll, I'll take a very quick round of questions. Um, if you have one, please raise your hand and uh, name affiliation and your question. Sir in the front, and then we'll do Lada in the back. Thank you. Uh, Stan Weeks, SAIC, and former U.S. Navy. Um, my question is, should we, uh, as we take whatever actions to deter Chinese uh, or mainland takeover or then to support Taiwan, going forward in the next 40 years, should we maybe adopt a uh, salami slice Taiwan policy where we take individual actions, uh, drawing on uh, China, the mainland's actions in the East and South China Seas and, uh, and, and their coercion to Taiwan, just take, take a number of actions uh, and sort of have a no big deal when, we're, when the inevitable protests come or do we need more of a, uh, would deterrence be strengthened by more of a big bang approach of an announcement of a new, uh, which might be a really big bang, an announcement of a new uh, uh, Taiwan policy or uh, review? Or an announcement of a mutual defense treaty. <laughs> um, Lada in the back. side, uh, what do you see as being uh, prospects for a, uh, a free trade agreement or a fair trade agreement? And what do you see as prospects for uh, a bilateral uh, investment treaty of some kind? Uh, just look at the economic side, because we've talked a lot about defense. And one more question back left. Yes. Sorry, Sorry can you just wait for the uh, microphone? Uh, my name is Gong Chen Chen uh, from University of Maryland, and a uh, very similar question. So many people in Taiwan uh, face the, the, uh, uh, the trade-off between national security and the economic interests. And uh, how do you guys evaluate the argument of trade peace? Thank you. Thank you. And then one last question, sir, in, this, in the center. Barnaby B.A., a freelance activist. Um, so I am actually quite heartened to hear that uh, people are waking up to the Chinese Communist Party and the United Front's uh, propaganda war for our minds. So the only question I'm posing to you is, uh, where do we start? Where are our front organizations? Where are our first responders and counter-propaganda uh, you know, uh, publications, et cetera? You know, how do we reach the degree of effectiveness that an organization like, say, APAC uh, has at, I wouldn't like, like to say controlling uh, the narrative, but uh, more so pushing and responding? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think we can just 
I'll kind of just give last comments and if and then everyone could address uh, some of these questions a lot on the prospects for free trade agreement, bilateral investment agreement between US and Taiwan, um, adopting a, a form of salami slice Taiwan policy and when it comes to deterrence, um, and also how to counter propaganda. Um, so we'll so kind of start. If I may, Dr. Weeks, to your question about salami slicing, I think that's exactly what we need to do. Because if, if we take grandiose sudden steps that are surprising to the government in Taipei, as they would be to the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing, that provides China with an excuse to take very provocative actions to counter what we just did. And so I think that is the value in doing things gradually, but you'll never get there if you don't have clear long-term objectives, if you're not thinking about where you want to be 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. That, that's the essence of this. Because once you know where you want to go, then you can take steps in that direction. And you don't have to wait until you're forced to the edge of a cliff to then fight your way back away from going over that cliff. And to the question about economic security versus hard security, I think there's a, a false choice that Beijing uh, presents Taiwan and other countries around the world. It pretends as though the future of the world economy is in China's hands. That's, that's false. There's no question about it. China's economy is not going to continue growing the way it has, and it is not the future of the global order or the global economy. If Taiwan and the United States and other countries want to have long-term prosperity, the best thing they can do is to start to get out of the China market. Because what we're seeing, if you look at the details of, of Made in China 2025 and China standards 2030 or 2035, and if you read some of the that really excellent studies have, that have come out of, of the administration uh, in recent months, it is increasingly clear that China is engaged in, in all-out economic warfare against democracies to actually undermine our best and brightest companies. And so if we do rely on the Chinese market for our future, we're in big trouble. We need to make sure that we are the future uh, of, of uh, global economics and that we do continue to protect ourselves against China's long-term economic strategy. And I think that's why uh, Taiwan is so essential, and it's so essential to the United States, for the US interests that we continue to cooperate heavily with, with Taiwan, because Taiwan is a leader, especially in, in ICT. Okay. Russell? If I may just um, address the first questions on uh, salami slicing from a different angle and look at it from deterrence. And I would just say that actually from a deterrence angle, I think we've been overly focused on the military dimension of deterrence and we're not focused enough on the political side of deterrence. I think that political uh, elements can actually go a long way in deterring China from engaging in provocative actions. And that means, and that's why I would actually point to the fact that I think a lot of times arms sales, the Chinese are not necessarily too uh, concerned about actually what the United States sells to United, uh, Taiwan, but it is in the political signal that an arms sales to Taiwan sends to Beijing and what it means for the future of the US-Taiwan relationship. And I think that this is an area where, you know, I think we have not leveraged enough in terms of how to deal with trying to maintain some type of uh, uh, um, uh, balance in the Taiwan Strait, a soft balance in the Taiwan Strait, where uh, I think that a lot of our actions right now are still focused on the military dimensions of it. But as speakers in the morning sessions have, uh, have also uh, referenced, um, that this is, there is a lot of non-military pressure that China is engaging in uh, against Taiwan, that actually a military response is not just gonna be, it's not gonna be adequate enough to address the longer term challenges of this type of, uh, I would say, uh, call it a gray zone operations in the political space. Um, so <clears throat> I think, you know, we need to look at the political elements of how to deter uh, China. Uh, secondly, I think on the question of um, <clears throat> on, uh, on propaganda, I would say that, you know what, I think it's, it's high time that we get back into the information operations game. Um, you know, I think this has been lagging uh, far behind in terms of how we engage with in this ideological competition that is clearly underway, that China is clearly waging its form of authoritarian capitalism in the world and it's providing this uh, vision uh, for autocrats um, uh, to, to further develop without liberalizing. And, uh, and we need to speak proudly about uh, the democratic model. And, uh, and that's, I think that's the first step. Secondly, also we need to demand reciprocity. I think that there is a complete asymmetry, asymmetry in terms of how we deal with China right now where China has ability to access and, uh, and what it's doing, exploiting the openness 
of democratic systems in order to uh, to engage in these types of uh, I'm, what I'm concerned of, of course, are those covert, corrupt, and coercive activities. And yet, it is further closing up uh, its own borders to a legitimate influence, uh, to even the legitimate influence. And um, and I think that you know we need to demand, we need to start demanding collectively uh, for reciprocity in this relationship with China, and at the very least, recognize this asymmetry and start doing something about it. And I think you know again, we need to mm-hmm. talk proudly about you know democracy. Um, um, yeah. Jessica, do you have any last comments? Um, just on the prospects for an FTA or bilateral investment treaty, um, I think we're too, Taiwan's too, the pork issue has become too politicized. So there either needs to be an internal debate or discussion on where to proceed from there, or I don't think the U.S. side is going to budge. All right. Uh, my closing remarks are that um, just looking at the whole discussion over the past uh, entire afternoon here, I see uh, two big dangers at play in the dynamics that we're seeing right now. Uh, one's on the U.S. side, one's on the Taiwan side. On the U.S. side, I think the big danger is that uh, when U.S. Um, policymakers and government officials and um, professors, academics, when they like don't do it necessarily consciously, but when they um, adopt uh, China's narrative and China's uh, interests. So when, when China is saying to the whole world, you know, uh, Taiwan's a part of China and all these things and reunification, it's really easy to, and I, I was just talking to um, a person that is really close to me and then um, who was a, a news reporter for ICRT, news broadcaster, United Nations diplomat with all this experience in Taiwan, who last week turned to me and said, oh, um, you know, the US's one China policy is that Taiwan is a province of China, right? And I said, like, no, right? So it's an opportunity to patiently like walk through the issues, but th- that's not the only person. A lot of people here in DC are hearing the narrative and they're adopting um, China's interests at the, um, at the sacrifice of US national interests. So that's one on the US side. Number two on the Taiwan side is um, at the especially grassroots level, especially during elections, especially with news commentators that haven't really worked the issues, that they could take um, US goodwill and US support and turn it into something negative. And then they could take Thai, uh, China's and then you know some kind of encouragement or and and like they could confuse who is the trusted partner and uh, what is the threat. They can turn that around. And if you're in a dangerous situation, as we talked about thoroughly in the first panel, you don't have that luxury of really confusing. You know who's the one that's trying to hack you with cyber measures, uh, or, and who's the one that's there economically for you unconditionally, dependent and unconditional of your political stance, and who's the one with thousands of CSS six missiles pointed at you? Like, like so you can't. So you're there, you have that situation where I think that is dangerous because, especially during elections, it leads to elected officials and pressures policies that then are uh, can can harm uh, U.S. Taiwan cooperation. So I think those are, are two things that I see that, that's going on right now. For the other questions, Ian and Russ addressed the first one pretty well. And on the trade, um, Jessica mentioned it, and also the first panel talked a lot about the prospects for um, a U.S.-Taiwan trade agreement, and also the hope that Taiwan would join some kind of TPP. I think on the, the economic issue, I mean, the most important is definitely Taiwan's semiconductor industry. And perhaps if if if, if a free trade agreement or a bilateral trade agreement is is too difficult. I, well, let me take a step back. I think US should address the trade issue with Taiwan as a strategic issue and not something that is solely siloed to the USTR and for commerce to battle each other out. If if the if the NSC says that a, a free trade agreement with Taiwan is essential and is of strategic interest to the United States, um, then Something I think should move forward from that. And short of that, I think establishing a bilateral um, working group between the US and Taiwan that's focused specifically on the defense supply chain, on semiconductors, um, I would say is at the in the next three months should be the most imperative. So how be- where Beijing is moving in 5G and where Beijing is moving in new technologies and in areas that really threaten Taiwan's economic prosperity and their future, but also the future of the United States. And I think there's a lot more that US and Taiwan can do immediately in that front um, through bilateral working groups um, while we hopefully adopt you know, more mechanisms to, to truthfully negotiate and discuss um, a, a full free trade agreement. And with that, I am terribly sorry for keeping everyone seven minutes over. But you know, I, hope, I hope everyone leaves 
with the question, you know, what is the ideal end state for US-Taiwan relations? And I think if every person here wrote an op-ed or wrote a blog that tried to address that question, we, we will be in a much better place you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now. So thank you, everyone. And thank you to my panelists. For and thank you, Rachel, for moderating.